so they, like, uh, machine learning techniques. Yeah. So we know where we stand. We had a great talk yesterday. Roy will pick it up right where we left off yesterday afternoon. So, and Roy doesn't need any additional introductions today. So let's just dive straight in. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks for uh, spending the second day with me. I do see some new faces, so welcome to uh, the second day. And as I just told some members, please, any of you, uh, you should feel free to reach out to me uh, by email uh, at, at, at any time. Okay, so where uh, we left it off. So yesterday's uh, session was focused on using prediction methods for the purpose of estimating poverty at a very disaggregated level. And we articulated a number of things why there may be an interest in that. Uh, first of all, create awareness and to facilitate uh, targeting and to both transfers, for example, following something like a fuel subsidy reform and so on and so forth. Here, uh, we're going to briefly talk about another uh, value that all areas might provide. They might provide the value input in further research. Think of using small areas, <laughs> small areas of poverty, inequality, and support in, in, in sort of further empirical regression analysis. So I want to sort of take a few slides that I'm sure to sort of illustrate how, what I might look like. Um, so a pure illustration, we'll see this a uh, sort of a standard growth regression of this form, where there is uh, growth in mean income per capita, for example, at the small a level i at time t, this regress on lagged growth, sorry, lagged, uh, lagged income level in, that, in this area, plus some controls. X plus A is a very long interest that might be say poverty. For example, that Martin Dalian has uh, an AAR paper published a couple of years ago that focused very much on the importance of poverty in, in sort of uh, economic development and growth. And so think, think of a regression of, of that type. Um, and so the nice thing is that in this case, if you if you run this growth regression in spider level, it opens the door to doing this type of analysis, right? Look at the drivers of growth, even for, for a one particular country, right? So conventionally, a lot of, it, of the empirical growth literature relies on cross-country data. Um, but in this case, you could tailor your empirical analysis on a very specific country, and you're exploiting the cross-sectoral cross, cross variation that you observe within that country. Um, um, okay, but there are some issues. Obviously, small area estimates of inequality or poverty, etc., um, are not observed data, right? So they are predictors of poverty or inequality at the small area level. And that has some implications that you should sort of uh, account for when you do this type of regression analysis. Just to list, oh, and there is whoever is, is interested in the nitty-gritty details of this type of work. So Chris Elbers and his co-authors have a 2005 paper in the Journal of Economic Geography that sort of delves, delves into this in, in much more detail. And if any of you are interested in starting to find the paper, just send me an email and I'll, I'll share the paper with you. But consider, uh, sort of make this point, just consider a standard that you Why is X better plus epsilon? Okay, so X is the, is the variable of interest. We don't observe X, but we observe predictions of X, right? So X, the unit conservation of X is at the small n level, and we observe uh, X tilde, which is say, the predicted or expected value of X conditional on a set of covariates that we use to produce those small n estimates. So that means that the actual true X would be this X tilde, which is this conditional rate of X plus some kind of error. okay? And uh, this Xi, I, I've been denoted this L term by Xi, so that you plug that into the, the assumed data generating process, right? You get that Y is X tilde beta. Now, X tilde is something we do observe. Um, and this Xi end up in the, in the residual, right? So now, the original epsilon plus is Xi times beta. Now, because Xi is a prediction error and not a measurement error, and I'll say a few words about that next, uh, C tilde and C are uncorrelated, and that's critical. That's, that, that's sort of separated from sort of the measurement error context that you, you might think of otherwise. So that means that these are, 
this and this guy are uncorrelated. <laughs> if Excel is furthermore uncorrelated with the, with the original idiosyncratic error in the suggestion model, then it follows that beta can be consistently estimated. Right? If if X is orthogonal with both of these error terms here, sort of your typical or even your OS estimate of, of beta will be will be consistent. But that is different from a measurement error context, right? Like every time I see this myself, I, I have to remind myself that this is a slightly different context. And I always get a little bit confused and I also end up confused off of breakfast this morning when I read with my own slides. And so I actually added this bullet right up for breakfast this morning. Uh, right in a measurement error context, it looks like this. It's X tilde is the variable you're interested in plus measurement error. That looks like a subtle difference, right? But it's crucial because in a measurement error context, the measurement error is now correlated with the variable you're observing. And that's going to introduce a bias if you're just going to run like a standard OS edition. But in this case, X is the X tilde is like the conditional expectation of X, sort of conditional on a set of variables you predicted, plus an error. So now this C is orthogonal to the variable we observe. And consequently, sort of your standard estimates for beta will be consistent. <coughs> any, any questions on that? Okay, that's not the end of the story though. So, okay, so we know that sort of your standard sort of regression, uh, your standard OS uh, or GLS if you want to account for, for, for spatial structure is consistent, but it doesn't account for the fact that, uh, that there is still uh, the two X and X still are still separated by uh, an error term. And, uh, and the, the model parameters that we use to generate X tilde are sort of uncertain themselves, right? So the conditional expectation of X conditional is covariance, let's call them Z, right? This is this is set of parameters that govern that condition of data, say theta, but we don't know theta. We can only estimate theta. So that will introduce a sort of uncertainty that will have to be, we can't ignore that uncertainty. It doesn't generate bias, so we have no systems, but it will have implications for the standards. If we're going to completely ignore that source of uncertainty and just run the regression treating X tilde as if it were two data without this additional source, then we're going to underestimate. Standards. We're going to overestimate this. So the next step is how do we get the standard error for for beta hat? Okay, so so in a nutshell, um, what you have to do is you run uh, uh, this regression x amount of time. So remember that um, even in order to get standard errors for the small area estimates. Remember that we do something like five hundred simulations. We pick, right? We, we for every for every household, we sort of draw simulate five hundred replications of their hypothetical incomes. That gives us five hundred poverty maps, and then the average was going to be the point estimate of say poverty or inequality in the small area level, and the standard deviation across those five hundred simulations would be the standard error for the small area estimate of poverty and inequality. We're going to do the same setup when we do regression analysis. Okay, so now we have these five hundred. Uh, all the maps here, it's five hundred all these maps at the small area level. Each of those we're going to treat as if it was two data, right? So each of those five hundred dots, just pretend these were like observations of small area poverty or small area inequality. So then that allows us to run that regression five hundred times, right? Each is treated with data, so we can run the, the regression that we're interested in with sort of that small area inequality in one of the right hand side variables. For each of those five kind of regressions, that will give us a point estimate of beta and it will give us standard errors. It will give us a variance for various metrics of that beta, right? So then ultimately the variance for various metrics of the beta we're interested in, we're gonna do this very decomposition. We're gonna have the expected value of the various for various matrix, right? We're gonna have five hundred various for various matrices. We take the expected value of that. So we're going to take the average variance covariance matrix over the 500 variance covariance matrix. And we have 500 point estimates, and we're going to compute the variance over those 500 point estimates. Okay? So those two combined will give us the complete 
Uh, so if you're if you were to sort of only use once, what you're primarily ignoring is sort of the second term over here, right? You're, you're going to get the, an approximation of this term, but you'll be ignoring that term, and consequently you'll be underestimating uh, standard errors. Sorry, we are ignoring the second term because it is unbiased, is it? Yes, the, the, yeah. So here we established that sort of in every single case, the estimate. So each of those five simulations, they have an unbiased. But if you estimate but we will not have efficient variance, right? Because it's it will big. be it will be provided that when you depends what you assume about the error term. So if the error term is IID, you're all less estimate will be efficient. If you want to accommodate for some sort of heteroskeletivity or spatial correlation structure epsilon, then I'm going to operate on the assumption that you implement the uh, say generalized least squares. So each of your five hundred times you run your generalized least squares, which will be the efficient estimator for every one simulation. But then still, you do the same thing. So, I mean, I'm just like, I'm not sure why you would still be a, an efficient estimator when you have, you know, the epsilon term in when your x delta and your error term is not, it's not independent, right? Sorry, what? I, don't... I am not sure like why it would still be efficient. Efficient yeah. efficiency. Yeah. The estimate will be efficient if yeah. if whatever structure is present in the subject deposit is accounted for in your estimator, right? So if your estimate is IID, so, so if this error term is IID, yeah. right, then a simple OLS will be will coincide with the maximum likelihood. So a maximum likelihood is the efficient estimate. So OLS coincides with maximum likelihood mm -hmm. if the error terms are IID. Yeah. If the error terms exhibit some heteroscelasticity or spatial correlation structure, OLS will not be efficient because it ignores that. But generally squares will then coincide with the maximum likelihood estimator. So getting efficient estimator is not a problem, provided that you account for whatever structure is part of the data, assumed data, data generating process. Any further questions on that? So the data will converge with the 500? Oh, it's very, this is a very straight one. Because basically you've done 500 times a very straight one like that. So, so again, let's assume for each of position, the errors are IID. Basically what you're doing is 500 times, you're running simple OLS. Every OLS will take a split second to run. Oh, so right? you find the variance of variance for variance of every yeah. 500 variables in exactly. the Exactly. So suppose you have a model, which say, I'm just saying, you run an aggression, say 10 variables on the right hand side, right? Mm -hmm. You have a broad regression, and you have, uh, say, uh, a thousand small areas, yeah. and you have, say, uh, half a dozen right hand side variables in the regression. You have 500 replications of the small area estimates. That you're interested in, right? So say, say suppose inequality of the variable of interest at this at the district level. So you have five for every area, for every district in the country of interest, you have 500 observations, oh. 500 points of inequality of level. For each of those realizations, you run a simple all estimation. It takes a split second. Then all the rest of gives you the point estimates of the regression coefficient, and it will give you the very covariance matrix of the regression coefficient. Okay. You store those. So you run three hundred times. That gives you five hundred replications of yeah. the, regress, the, the regression coefficients mm -hmm. and the various covariance matrix. Yeah. That's easy, right? So that's that for every one regression, it literally takes a fraction of a second. You multiply that by five hundred, it's still a few seconds. Oh. This term over here, this variance, is the various covariance matrix. So you have five hundred of those, and you just go into the average. So you simply take the average over five hundred matrices. Easy peasy. This here is the regression coefficient themselves. You have 500 of them, and you're going to evaluate the variance over those 500 regression okay. coefficients. Okay. Sorry, I thought that the size of the variance itself is 500, but no, the 500 no. is the observation. It's, it's like, exactly. So okay. you're, you're taking the expected value, and here the variance over 500. So you just average the yeah. 500 observations. Yeah. If you had the, the size of the matrix, it's dictated by the number of variables that are in the regression. So if there are six variables, it will be six by six. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Easy, easy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so uh, just just for uh, pure illustration, uh, I just run I ran it so put together uh, like a, a quick illustrate uh, illustrate the example illustrative example. Uh, so there is this is I briefly alluded yesterday I think that there is this literature that um, that tries to revisit the relationship between growth and inequality. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, it finds that the relationship between processing quality and quality itself is rather uh, inconclusive. Very often they've got a zero effect or slightly negative, slightly positive, depending on what the you use. But it doesn't appear to be a very clear cut relationship between inequality and growth of a particular site. Uh, which had puzzled sort of the, the literature a little bit, uh, because the, the theoretical literature somehow expected this relationship to be able to sign, and it wasn't borne out by the data. Then, uh, more recently, there's been this effort to one key paper to look at, if you're interested in this, is the Marira, Marira and Rodriguez 2013 paper that was published in the Journal of Development Economics, that de decomposes total inequality into two subcomponents. In an inequality of opportunity component, right, which tries to capture the extent to which individual income or education success is due to factors that are completely beyond the control of the individual. Think of factors like parental income, race, religion, etc. right? A, a person doesn't choose his or her parents, doesn't choose his or her race, etc. So ideally in a society, it's your talent and your hard work that should dictate your outcomes, not circumstances that you have absolutely no control over. So that, call that inequality of the component. And a residual component. And the residual component now now that we've sort of accounted for it, called duty, will capture things like uh, things like uh, factors that reward risk taking, factors that reward hard work, etc. Right? So, in a, factors that generate inequality that, that are within within your control. And so, by decomposing that total inequality to those two factors, the sum of inequality opportunity and let's call it inequality of effort or inequality of risk taking, um, they ran this regression using state-level data on uh, growth for the United States, covering like a 50, 60 year period. And they discovered that, so first they ran the regression of total inequality at the state level on sort of uh, growth at, with, at 10 year increments. And they confirmed that the relationship is very fragile. up. There isn't much of a relationship to speak of. But once the decomposed total inequality at the state level between the inequality of opportunity and the residual inequality of the they find that inequality of opportunity is strongly negatively correlated with growth. And yeah, the, sort of the interpretation they attach is that it's high levels of inequality of opportunity uh, will amount to like wasting of human capital, wasting of human capital, right? Because you'll end up, it's a society where perfectly talented individuals uh, are not given the opportunities to make the most of their talent precisely because they run into obstacles that prevent them from developing their talent. And so their their human capital potential human capital ends up getting wasted, which is which is the inefficiency that we're talking about. Um, anyway, so in this sort of empirical illustration, we revisit that in, uh, using data for Vietnam. So uh, we I was able to get my hands on two poverty maps that were carried out by someone else, <laughs> some of my colleagues of Vietnam, using the census for 1999 and the census for 2009. So now at the community level in Vietnam, or the district level, uh, productive level it was, we have uh, small area estimates of total inequality and inequality of opportunity. And so that allows us to sort of uh, run a similar type of regression than what they did for, uh, for the United States, but now but now we're Vietnam. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, but if I think about, so in that case, you know, for Marrero and Rodriguez works out, so imagine, suppose, at some level, let's say, think about, you know, your parental network, social capital, which are all also, you might say, are inequality of opportunities, which are not going to be observable, right? They're going to go into this residual term, and you're going to say that is comprised of, you know, what you said, like hard work, my determination, sure. and here, by turns out to have a positive sign, so the story spins quite nicely, right? Could be that these other residual factors, which we are now saying are hard work and stuff, are actually these inequality of opportunity on observables and the sign could immediately flip but so i'm just saying that it's still hard to get a so fair enough so so i guess i guess uh i guess i guess total inequality should be decomposed into three terms it's the inequality of opportunity that is observed the inequality of opportunity that is due to services that not observed and then it's inequality yeah now the more circumstances we're able to observe the more clean it will be our uh, will be our inequality part, and the, the um, and 
the more that a certain that we come from, the especially the residual part, will we still be a mix. Mm. And so I think you would still expect, at least at that story holds true, to pick up the negative effect on in opportunity, even yeah. though it's a subset, right? Uh, but I think we can all agree that that's, that's an inefficiency that's going to be there. But you might not be able to pick up that positive effect from the residual because it might still be a mix of some residual in opportunity and, and sort of factors that, that are, that, that might well be positive. A positive factor score for growth. So I think that's a fair point. And so that, that decomposition between negative drive of growth and positive drive growth will get stronger, the cleaner and the more circumstances we're able to, to account for. So that was a good question. Any okay. So so have the great equivalent is one of the part of the right? So what? The difference between these two terms, I was going to be going to be on that one from two terms. Means that her uh, is, a, is a part of the two terms. Uh, yeah, so, so total inequality, if you, I mean, so typically you would use a measure of inequality that is sub two from the proposal. Well, not every measure is like the G, for example, is not. But the mean of deviation is. So the mean of deviation, mathematically, can be written as the sum of these two components, one capturing. The, the G group in part, which is the important part, mm -hmm. and then the Swedish group in part, part that is the residual important component. So it's literally totally important, literally the sum of these two, two components. Uh, mean of standard deviation, uh, I don't think it satisfies the ego that can get in this. Probably you may want to go for time. I'm so that, yeah, so, so any, any general entropy measure in equality because we will be satisfied. You know, yeah. yeah. So, we go down to the is not good. Yeah. Uh, so so the so the, the papers are something that I've seen that typically in their robustness analysis will will sort of try different measures of inequality. Even a Gini, even though strictly speaking, it does sub will be proposable. But uh, the results can qualitatively carry over. So whether you Gini or mean deviation or I uh, each of which will have their own pros and cons. It doesn't automatically sort of change the, the results that the uh, that type of analysis will, will, will give you. It does carry on. So I should note uh, before I show you the results here um, um, there have been efforts to reproduce these results in a large cross country setting, and there the results were less conclusive. So, 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 and it's, it's, um, it's, it's, what can I spit as to the reasons why? But like so the US, just using the US, this, this sort of decomposed story I just told you holds up very strongly. It's very nicely borne out in the data. But uh, Francisco Pereira, Bert Kostler, Christian Lachner, and somebody else, I uh, forgot the other author's name, they tried to uh, do the exact same kind of regressions, but now using cross country data that covers something like 100 plus countries in the world. Now you this is country, not a subnational sort of state. And and the results were very fragile. Even the if even the ratio between inequality of maturity and, and growth was fragile. And one can speculate as to multiple reasons, right? One is that uh, maybe that strong, maybe some sort of inequality of maturity is a phenomenon that is very strongly present in a country like the United States. And it may that that narrative may not apply equally strongly to other countries in the world. One possible explanation. Uh, another is that once you start to cross country divisions, it, it becomes much more noisy, right? So within a country where you use this one source of data, give this one definition of any opportunity that you can cleanly apply to every single state in your data set. Once you start doing cross country, right? You don't have the exact same data, the exact same circumstances, the exact same outcome variables in each country. So you have to sort of get a little bit creative. You'll use one set of circumstances in one country, another set of circumstances in another country. They have different ways of measuring income, different ways of measuring. And so cross country data inevitably is going to import a lot of mm, noise, if you will, that way. That might also sort of uh, attribute to weakening uh, any sort of patterns that you're trying to uh, pick up on. Okay. Yes. What are the methodologies that they use to do the decomposition? Just like Hawker Blinder, some of the essential data? No, no, it's simply like subgrouping and body decomposition. Mm -hmm. So if you Google subgroup in a body decomposition, you're going to find lots of papers. That, uh, so, so, so any general, ent um, general entropy, so mean of deviation, tile, uh, 
etc. Uh, are sub decomposable. So you get they get top where total inequality can be written as a sum of a between group inequality component and a within group inequality component. And in this case, between group means inequality between groups that are beyond your control, right? Think of high income parents, low income parents, uh, different racial identities, uh, born in a poor neighborhood, born in a rich neighborhood, uh, different religions. These, these are the different groups. So you don't, ideally, you don't want to. You don't want to see major difference between those groups because individuals have no control over, over which group they belong to. The small area here in Vietnam, right? Is that uh, across the states in Vietnam or across the villages in Vietnam? Not villages. It's, a, it's smaller than states, bigger than villages. It's somewhere in between. District, D district or community. Yeah. Uh, this district, 610 districts. So we have basic level estimates of low income per capita and inequality uh, for those two time periods. There's a total of a little over 600 districts. Uh, we have, so the outcome variable here is education. And uh, we have uh, total education inequality. That's the M of the edu. And then we have educate, where we distinguish between whether the children are from poor family background versus Rich family backgrounds, and we look at sort of the between group inequality. So, to what extent the education of a child is shaped by whether they are their parents are rich or poor. And then we have a set of control variables, the standard right? sort of overall education, demographics, population counts, access to roads, probation. Again, this is this is not like a Super carefully worked out study that was sent to the journal. This is uh, a quick, quick sort of critical analysis to give you a bit of a flavor of what it would look like to use a uh, small AS as an information analysis. Having said that, the results make sense. Mm -hmm. At least we're able to reproduce some of the same patterns that uh, Marrero and Rodriguez obtained for, in their application to the United States. Uh, so these are the these are the district level. Maps for Vietnam. Um, this is the, the, the growth data at the district level uh, for Vietnam. This is uh, our total inequality. This we should talk about. So as you can see, it varies considerably across across uh, districts in Vietnam, levels of inequality. So there's a lot of variation, both in growth and in inequality. Uh, and this is the the share of inequality is attributable to uh, to where, where the children are uh, part of high income households or low income households, and these are the these are the growth projections. And again, this the standard errors that are reported here take account of the fact that we have that we're working with sort of uh, predicted small areas. And so it's that 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 very deep composition where we compute the average parents per family days, but we add to it. The variance of the point estimates per regression problem, which is probably about five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> so, one case we include uh, region fixed effects, as we don't. So, region fixed effects is a more aggregate level. It's lower than national, but it's significantly right. higher than the district level. Um, and so, uh, the uh, lagged uh, income per capita is negative, right? That should be expected. That convergence, convergence effect. And then we see that um, we have a specification where we allow for a set of control variables and a specification where we don't allow for a set of control variables. Uh, I have to admit it's a quickly, it's a quick set of control variables that we put together. Uh, but as you can see, um, uh, inequality opportunity has uh, this strongly significant negative relationship with growth at the district level in, uh, in Vietnam. Um, it reduces when we add this, the, sort of the, the magnitude coefficient is reduced when we add the set of controls, but it, it's, it's a statistical significance uh, survives in both cases. And uh, here inequality of total inequality, when you control for inequality has this positive effect. And Roy, what was what did you what was what was um, inequality of opportunity here? Just the differences in your parental 
it's the it's the, the the lack of inequality in years of schooling of a child between and the circumstances that they have come over is is the income level the best. Ah, it's the income level. Yeah, so to okay. one extent, a child's education is conditional contingent on parental income. Okay. So, yeah. uh, sorry, so my these are regional these are regional regression. Right? How do you this like is, that? Let's take a little of six hundred districts. And these are averages, education level of children. Which one? So these eyes here are is, is the eyes is the district. This one. and so the units of observation is a district. Right. But then for example, what's the children variable What is the what? Children variable or elderly variable. That's a proportion of? Ah, sorry, but that's a good question. I think that's the share of children. It's like there are no statistics. What is the percentage of ah. children on average in the district? What's the share of elderly in the district? Yeah, it's literally just what is the Share of children age zero to 15, I think, mm -hmm. and the other one is like 65 for older. And these are 10 years before, right? E minus one is 10 years before. It's like, yeah, so all the all the right hand side variables are like by 10 years. So they're observed in 1999. The, the dependent variables growth between 1999 and, uh, and 2009. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, I find it fascinating that in this condition on these controls is higher. Ah. Yeah, cross reading the Cross district, yeah. So the education minus four is the interaction terms? Or when you No, it's not minus. Sorry, that's my quotation. It's a dash. It's not okay, it's, so you yeah, it, it by your four. It's it just means that we look at inequality in education between between poor children and rich children. It's children for poor parents and rich parents. So it's not a sorry, it's not a minus. Mm -hmm. It just it's just trying to say that this is it looks at between between group inequality. So we look at children that are born in rich households, mm -hmm. children born in poor households, and we look at uh, how different the education outcomes are. So is it has negative impact on the inequality. That means the the variation between them is big. Yeah. It, it, well, it means that it's it means that it is like if if. If, if it means that if uh, the education system children is, is what is if that is um, significantly shaped by parental income success, which children have no control over, right? Then that is distortion. It's like it's an it's a threat on economic growth, right? Then the, the interpretation is that uh, you may have children that are perfectly talented, but they happen to be born into poor circumstances. And so they're unable to live up to their potential. Mm -hmm. And so their human prospective human capital ends up getting wasted, which is an inefficiency that's bad for growth. So the early the early variable it has no uh, differentiations between the you know your parents are poor or your the first one, the just MLD education, that's just total, it's just total inequality in education as well. Yeah. Um, but the conclusion is mostly for the children when they have education, like the children's one. Compared to the next one that is depression, it's like the right people, right? Yeah. 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 So yeah. Can you tell me this one? Yeah, so that's why I told you earlier. So, so inequality of maturity is, has, has a negative for certain growth, and I think the reason why it's included. But when we control for that, right, the residual inequality component. Operating on the assumption that sort of most of the circumstances are accounted for, right, will capture inequality in the due to factors that are not necessarily bad for growth. Think of like uh, uh, societies encouraging risk taking, rewarding hard work, uh, etc. Right. So just be, that's not that's not evident. There are societies that where that is where hard work and risk taking is uh, is less important, and as a result. You will end up seeing less risk taking, less hard work, which will then in itself be, be like a negative for for future economic growth. The same for the guide, uh, the guide that we have to show the indicators. The sign is indicated. So yeah, that's that's the word it's about. That's a standard sort of standard uh, feature of growth regression. <laughs> So, 
but just for clarification, because of this T and T minus one notation, you just run this in one cross section. It's one cross section. Like exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a single cross section rotation where all the right are left. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. To avoid sort of uh, obvious end of Yeah. Oh, single, 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 yeah. It's a thing over there. Yeah. Although, if we get the standard errors right, remember, we ran the simulation 500 times in order to get the correct standard errors. Yeah. The but unit, that all the yeah. unit is in percent, so that means the, the growth will decline by 0.38 percent. Or, like for example, the numbers here, the in percent. It's a uh, it's, uh, it's lot more growth. Yeah, so yeah. it's not normalized by 10 months. This, uh, to be completely out of the some years ago, yeah. so I don't remember all the specific. <laughs> yeah. I think it makes sense, right? Because uh, the growth is going to drive by 0.28%. If you take 2.8%, there's a big, big, right? Like 2.28%, 2.8%. So I'm going to guess it's annualized. <laughs> is that what you mean? No, no, I'm saying that then. Uh, yeah, I think the, the number has already been, uh, it's elasticity, right? Because if it's log log on both sides, it's a, it's log it's log growth. It's log difference. That's, that's how we measure growth. Yeah, I'm saying that the interpretations here it makes sense. And uh, for the growth to decline by zero point three percent or zero point two eight percent, not to multiply more by hundred percent. Which coefficient are you now pointing to? Uh, so any coefficient. So for example the. Inequality of opportunities. Yeah, but then you have to multiply it with that variable, right? So the effect to get the effect of growth, you have to multiply the coefficient with that variable. And I don't know from so we have to expect. So for example, if you look at M of the education, right? So on average you say 0.2. So you have to multiply this coefficient of say 0.2 or 0.07 times something that varies between 0.1 to 0.3. And that this that combined effect. Is, is what makes the contribution yeah. to it's the really problem. Small, because point 0.2 multiplied with point zero two just now, I multiply with a zero point. It's small, isn't it? It is. Uh, point 0.2 multiplied yeah, so I think, but it's, but it's, it, I think it's analyzed. Okay, so it may be an economically modest effect. Maybe. I would have to. Uh, so in some cases, say, in, in a really other places, it's say 0 0.4, 0 0.4 times. 0 0.2, 0 0.0. Yeah. But that's not, that's not, that's, it's low difference, right? So 0 0.1 in low difference is 10% growth, right? Yeah. So that's not a small number. Yeah, 10%. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Right? And then if it's 40 average, we're talking about 5%. Mm -hmm. So that's not, a, that's, not a, okay. that's not necessarily a small number. Yes, yes. So I thought after we multiply with the 100%, yeah. 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 Any further questions? Okay, so that's, that's, that concludes the session that, uh, that we originally scheduled um, to end yesterday with. So that concludes the, um, the, the, the small air estimation part. So now we start the sessions that was originally scheduled for today. And uh, so today we're going to focus on uh, it's still measuring poverty. We're still using prediction methods, but to a different end. So yesterday we uh, adopted prediction methods to allow us to estimate poverty at this very granular level. Today the focus will be not so much estimating poverty at the granular level, which goes mind. The focus will be to track poverty at the more aggregate level, but at the higher frequency of time. Um, and um, the reason for that is that uh, um, <coughs> there are a lot of situations where data, the type of data you would need to track poverty or other indicators of welfare are very scarce uh, and don't allow you to monitor it that measure of interest at the relatively high frequency. Um, and so the only way to then fill in the gaps is if one would resort to uh, predictive methods. And in this case, one would be predicting into any other sort of data that one might be able to get their hands on that would allow them to fill the gaps. 
And this often means that one will have to get a little bit in, because depending on the alternative source of data you're going to use for your prediction exercise, the prediction method will have to be tailored to sort of fit, fit that complex thing. And the reason for why you might have like sparse data or, um, or low frequency data, they can vary for a whole variety of reasons, right? So it could be because the carbon is a conflict, right? The carbon is a conflict, and during the phase of conflict, it's very risky to send interviews into the field to conduct surveys. And so if a country enters a 10 year period of conflict, you may have a period of 10 years where no in phase survey data is being collected. And so then, if you want to monitor how things are progressing in that country during this period, you'll have to get creative and see if there's any other sorts of data or other, other data collection means that you might be able to. That's one. Another is uh, it's costly, like um, collecting good quality household survey data is costly, you know, resources are limited. Countries or states may only be able to afford to sort of do, to sort of organize survey data collection every five or so years, right? Um, but if, if there are many changes within those five years, uh, there might be uh, benefits in trying to figure out how things have, might have changed following uh, a significant policy change or a negative shock or a positive shock. In the and there might be a whole cohort of other reasons why data ends up being scarce. Like, I understand that there are data scarce issues in Malaysia. Um, this is probably not because it's expensive, it's probably not because the country is conflict. There are other reasons why the data ends up being scarce. And, and you, you may have come to surprise me here that two is not really in this country. Like, I've just concluded the project in a uh, public measurement project in India, and I'll show you. I'm going to use that as my illustration. The same thing applies there. So there hasn't been any survey data made available in India since 2011. And so anyone interested in one, and plenty of things have happened in India over the last uh, 10 plus years, right? But no idea how welfare may have evolved in India since then. And so, and so I'm just going to put that in the other issue, other, other, the other bucket. So there are lots of reasons why they can, you may end up in a data scarce environment, um, and then try to work out how poverty or inequality might have evolved in the data scarce environment. The only way to say something is to employ uh, data prediction methods. He says here, unlike the unlike the the poverty mapping, where you have this very well defined context, you know exactly the shape and form of the, the data you want to work with. Uh, and so it's like one size fits all. Whatever approach you adopt to build a poverty map in country A, the data in another country will like similar shape or form and the approach uh, needed will be very similar. In this case, it's a bit different. This involves a lot more variability. And every data scarce environment, every different country, the data you end up having to work with is going to take on a different form and, and you'll have to adjust your your prediction methods uh, according to make the best use of whatever data you're able to, 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 uh, to work with. Uh, yes, I said, so I'm gonna use India just as an illustrated example. Um, so let me, let me first say that, um, again, the, 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 the fact that sort of uh, survey data isn't collected at a high frequency in most countries is because, so I'm abstracting, I'm abstracting away now from the India situation and the Malaysia situation and the COVID situation. Even if you ignore all of those reasons, still in most countries, survey data is only collected once every three, four, five years, simply because it's costly, right? Uh, someone like the, the World Bank, despite the fact that surveys are typically only available every three, four, five years, still wants to monitor poverty at the global and regional level Every year, every year we update our estimates of what the sort of global poverty situation looks like across the world. And so it, the, the World Bank is very familiar with having to adopt some kind of prediction method in order to line up and you know, fill in the gaps in, in between surveyors. And that's what it calls the lining up method. Now, to give you a flavor of what kind of prediction method the World Bank routinely uses to that end, so we're happy to it used to be called POFCOMNET, now I think it's called PIP. And I don't know if any of you have ever consulted 
the World Bank's database with sort of global data on fault inequality. What it does, it takes the most recent year which the household survey data was collected, and it then looks at national accounts. So at that point, you have a you observe the income distribution in the country. It then looks at national accounts data, which is available in more countries every single year. And it then tries to sort of extrapolate how that income distribution might have evolved forward by sort of applying the national account growth data to the average income per capita observed in the income distribution, operating, applying the assumption that inequality hasn't changed over a period of time. Okay, so they observe that the country has seen so much percent income growth, it uses that to extrapolate average income per capita in, this, in the most recent survey, assumes the inequality change, so that allows you to piece together what the total income distribution might look like today, and then it can ex sort of extract from that its measures of poverty and inequality. Well, inequality will not have changed, so measures of poverty. Now, that is fine in most countries because if, if, if survey cost is the only reason why there's no data, the typical gap you're going to encounter is one, two, three, at most four years. And so, doing an extrapolation extra like this to fill in the one or two year gap. Is, uh, is forgivable. Um, but in some countries, and India is one of them, if you have to bridge a 10 year gap, this becomes very, very noisy, right? So these assumptions really start to become problematic and you, you're, 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 uh, you become vulnerable to making some serious errors in, 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 in your predictions. And so, one, what is that force of thinking about? Well, is there something better uh, uh, we can do? But isn't there any other problem with this extrapolation is that income level poverty estimates, I'm guessing, must be different from consumption level poverty estimates, right? When you go from income to consumption, there's a lot of policy measures that Yeah, so 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 actually the difference in income and uh consumption uh when it computes like global as sort of correct on the uh, carbon, but it is true that sort of the the, the the income data is like the initial accounts, is obviously different from the income data that is the income or consumption data that is like the survey. So they don't assume a one one relationship. So there is what they call a pass through rate, I don't know if you've heard of it. And so it using uh, historical data, let's take India as an example, they will look at uh, growth rates observed in surveys over the past X number of survey accounts that are available. It, it sort of uh, it relates that correlates that with national income growth, national income growth data to figure out what the past rate is. So, right, on average, if they see that 10% uh, growth in national accounts lines up with 6% uh, growth in mean per capita consumption in the survey, they, they sort of uh, establish this past rate and then they apply that sort of out of level. So then they acknowledge that sort of the income measure that is observed in national accounts is obviously not the same right. as uh, yeah. Okay, so that's this past rate that's written here. Um, okay, so the, the NSS 2011 is the, is the latest survey that was uh, released in India. Uh, India is, uh, is, uh, is obviously a hugely important country for the World Bank because it's home to a really big share of the, of the global poor. Uh, for years, they applied this extrapolation method, the line up method, but at some point it became unpalatable. And so and so we were tasked to come up with a, a better, a better approach. And this is where some, some creativity comes into play because then the first thing you do is okay, what data can we possibly get our heads on that might allow us to do? And and people have come up with uh, different approaches. Um, and in fact, I'll show you later, but pure coincidence, I didn't know. So I was me and my person were given the task to try to come up with something better for India. And uh, it was a team that I met across the street from us that were given a similar task by their sort of uh, management team. And so, unbeknownst to the both of us, we were both sort of uh, implementing our own best strategy as to working out how poverty will be involved in India over the last 10 years. And with our, our studies came out within days of each other. Wow. And as you'll see later, with markedly different ideas of how poverty in India has evolved. Um, 
uh, and they also show you that our data is important. The prediction methods with the assumptions that are on the line are hugely important because different choices of data, different choices of assumptions you're going to make, make can make very material differences in the result you're going to get. Now, the journalists in India love it, so they have a field day because they these two big institutions that take this completely different narrative of how far India evolved. And so both our studies ended up being like front page news for an extended period of time. Um, in our case, we used uh, a CPHS survey. So this is a survey that was, uh, that was carried out by the private sector. So because the public sector stopped collecting data, at some point, actually, India did collect survey data in 2017, flirted with the idea of making the data public, and then never ended up making it public. So, in effect, the, so the, the India Bureau of Statistics never released any data since 2011. And so, at some point, the private sector stepped in and said, hey, there is a market here for us. We are going to start collecting household survey data, and we're going to sell it to researchers and whoever is willing to start releasing data. So now this is the only source of household consumption data that's out there. It's a survey collected by the private sector. The company is called CMIE. But it's it's not the same rigor and quality that so the NSS the in India was known for the longest time to be like this really solid exemplary sort of this agency that produced top-notch it's a very high capacity sort of agency that produces top-notch quality data. Um, the CPHS said it's it's not doesn't live up to the same sort of, uh, but it's the, it's what we have to work with. There is nothing nothing better this from this point. But for one, um, it it tends to like I remember that I told you yesterday that surveys have a tendency to undercut the rich and the poor, right? The rich because it's very hard to get the rich to sort of. Well, first of all, they are small number, so they're rarely sampled. But if you sample, they're very high in the poor state. The poor. The really poor are hard to cover because they tend to live in more remote, harder to access, more expensive to reach places. Now, the NSS was making a concerted effort to start reach us, right, in order to sort of reduce any, any bias uh, to that end. This private sector company is making a less than concerted effort. And so, and so they have a bigger undercoverage of households in their tales than what the, 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 the original household survey data. And so we have to, that, that leads to a lack of representativeness that is something that we need to address. And I'll say a little bit more about it later. Anyway, so I just gave you a flavor of the results. I'll give you like a preview. So the, the, the blue line is what uh, the study between myself and my co author. Uh, my co author is Shin Roy, and so this is me. And for the longest time, we thought his, his name was the pseudonym is Roy. But it was really weird to see the depicting reference because it was like Roy and Father Weiger. <laughs> like this word this end between my first and last. <laughs> very, very well. um, so, so we have the blue line. And uh, according, so, we, so poverty has declined in India by our estimates. Um, and it seems well, like the, I'll show you some corroborative evidence later on. India has seen a lot of, sort of economic, sustained positive economic growth. And so, it's, it's consistent with poverty having come down, but not as much as what the IMF. Um, and uh, part of the reason why auto studies created so much promotion is that uh, this whole poverty debate, I don't know how it is here in Malaysia, but it's extremely polarized in India. There are like these two camps, there's the camp that are very loyal to the government, and the government, of course, wants to see very high poverty reduction. So the government loved the IMF study. That showed that poverty had been reduced to like five percent in India, um, but as the sort of academia and the more sort of the, the more intellectual community in, in India, they're very skeptical of the current government in India, and they believe that they're so they're very skeptical of anything that shows improvements. <laughs> <laughs> and so. And so we were stuck with both camps. Like at least the IMS started to count support from one of the camps. Like we, we ended up not getting any love from either camp. Like the, the government sort of uh, hated us because of this other study that shows that they were making one bigger strides to reduce poverty than we did. And the academic community didn't like us because they thought that poverty surely could not have to come down because the government is uh, 
Yeah, but the Balla is actually he's he's a spokesperson spokesperson of that BJP government, so he's going to always exactly. So I, I don't want to say it myself, but yeah. <laughs> but yeah, but I didn't say it. <laughs> Yeah, so Bar is the he was the uh, executive director. He was on the board. He was the board member for India at the IMF at the time the study was. I mean, Bala has been having his debate before for thirty years now since ninety six with Himanshu saying, "Hey, poverty didn't go down," and Bala, that poverty has gone. Well, Himanshu was already part of the sort of the like, like, yeah. yeah. Himanshu, we managed to bring him over. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it took a little bit of back and forth, but Himanshu. So there are there are people. There's certainly. Uh, they, they certainly, yeah, the, the Imanshu took his role in the other groups, etc. Jean Dres, et they, they, I mean, they all, there's very few academia that take Balas estimates uh, seriously. seriously. We've had a lot of active debates, and I would feel like part of the academic community is, is now, uh, is comfortable mm. with that work. But there are a part that, are, it's a very dogmatic also, like there are people that have very strong priors, and, and, um, it's very difficult to sort of have have some of these individuals sort of uh, put put those priors aside. Uh, but yeah, this is just I mean, as I said, it was like front page news for like uh, for like weeks on end. Um, this is just some bunch of examples. Um, anyway, so. Just to give you an idea of uh, what it uh, what, what it took. So we just give it just some data. And you might encounter some of the skeleton yourself if you do a similar application here in Malaysia, or if you end up doing an application in the other areas across the environment. So it's simply test. It collects uh, also survey data. There's no other data set that makes such an effort. It's just not as detailed as what the what the NSS does. So it has uh, it collects uh, for some data 150 items. And that's significantly smaller, I forgot the exact number, than what the NSS collects. So it's less granular, less detailed. Right. But still, it's still a decent consumption basket that consists of 150 items. It is a big survey, 170,000 uh, households. And the other advantage of this survey is almost continuously in the field. Right? So even the NSS, before, before it stopped releasing data, it was conducted like once every five years, 10 minutes or so. This survey is continuously in the field. So every half year, every Twice a year or so, in principle, we are able to sort of come up with an estimate. So the last one is poverty and inequality at a, at a high frequency. But it has, some, it has been heavily scrutinized by the academic circle for this issue of lack of representatives. The fact that disproportionately undercovers households in both, both, both days. And so uh, that's one challenge that we have to concern with. Um, the other challenge is that it uses its own sort of consumption question, right? So whatever measure of consumption it's going to obtain is not directly comparable to the measure of consumption that, that, that was adopted by the NSS uh, prior. So you can't just, without making any adjustment, just compare it. So some, so two efforts we have to sort of um, employ if we want to have any hope of comparing sort of estimates of poverty in recent years to, to the, the most recent official estimates probably dating back to 2011. One is we have to find a way to restore representativeness in the survey, like to correct for the fact that there is this undercoverage in both fields. And the other is to make sure that the measure of consumption in the CPS is somehow comparable, made comparable to the consumption. These are the type of challenges you'll get if you'll do this type of work with a different choice of data set. In, uh, these are the type of challenges you'll, you'll be expected to sort of uh, contend with. So the first thing we did is, um, it's the same type of prediction method that we did with both methods, right? So we, we identify the set of covariates that are, that are shared between the C, this private survey and the public survey. And they're very rich, like the both of the is a lot of, like all the democratic things, education, employment, asset, you name it, they have a very rich set of covariates shared between them. Uh, then we train this model in the most recent access data that was still publicly available. We train the model to the private consumption survey, and then by construction, we have to fit in access compatible sort of consumption data into this private survey. 
This, of course, operates on the assumption that, so first of all, this completely ignores this very rich variable, right? <laughs> but it also uh, operates on the assumption that sort of those are regression coefficients that normally stay all the time, right? So we estimate the problem in 2011, then we take it to 2016, 17, 18, 19, and we somehow operate on the assumption that the regression model is stable all the time. When we do that, uh, one of the things uh, we notice is that um, there are gaps in high points. So when we impute household consumption data into this private survey, and we inspect the distribution of consumption, global consumption, in the private survey we see, and we compare it to the distribution of global consumption that we observed the last time that as an official NSF survey was available, is that in the private survey, global consumption is much more symmetrically distributed than the consumption data in the old. And completely ignoring that will have implications. It won't necessarily have implications for average for consumption, but it will have implications for, say, estimates of poverty. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why we also adopt, sort of uh, look into approach two. That was one reason. The two is one is we want to address that gap in high moments. The second reason is we thought it was kind of wasteful to ignore the consumption data that was basically collected, right? And that's arguably the most strongest predictor that we're not completely ignoring. Mm -hmm. And so ideally what you would want to do is you want to estimate the relationship between those two different measures of consumption, right? What is the relationship between the consumption data collected in this private survey versus the consumption data that is collected in, uh, in the, the NSS? And the differences in terms of frequency of recall or the consumption yeah. bundles itself are different or? Well, no, it's mostly the consumption bundle. So the okay. basket is much more detailed in, in the, the NSS. NSS the challenge, of course, is if we don't have any households where, like, it's not, it's not like anybody collected a survey where they gave a sample of households the two different questions. Right? We don't have any households where both measures of the subject. So we can't have this question. And so, what do we do? And so, uh, what we can do is employ a methods of moment study. Right? So basically what you do uh, is, just for ease of exposition, let's assume that there is a one year where, even though we don't sample the same households, but, but both surveys were carried out. Okay, so the private company surveyed a sample of households, the NSF surveyed a sample of households, they're all sample of households, and they can't be linked, but we have these two samples of households that collect this data. Well, we can evaluate the first moment on both sides of this equation. We can evaluate the second moment, we can evaluate higher moments, both sides of the equation. That gives us, we need, a, we need a minimum of three moment conditions to estimate all of the parameters. Like we have three parameters, we have the intercept, we have the slope coefficient b, and we have the variance of the error term. So we need a minimum of three moment conditions in order to solve for those three coefficients. And so that's what we end up with. Now, the, the other challenge is here that uh, uh, the data, in this case, fitted best with the log NSS consumption on the right hand side of this equation and uh, the private survey on the left hand side of this equation. It fits the data better, but it costs uh, a little bit of a practical challenge because ultimately what we want to observe is the imputed, the, the NSS consumption equivalent for every household in CPHS, right? Mm -hmm. And so now just imagine if you know all the parameters, you know A, you know B, you know sigma, uh, and you observe the CPHS consumption Inverted. for every household in this private survey. But how do I pick out what that implies NSS consumption is using this relationship? So what, somehow what you have to do is you have to work out what is the distribution for any one given household of the NSS consumption conditional on observing the CPHS consumption. Uh, so now there's actually that normal mixture approach that I told you about yesterday. That lemma that is derived from the paper sort of exactly comes in handy here. Because that conditional distribution is exactly that EB approach that I told you about yesterday. So we, we can literally just take that lemma for that study and work out what the conditional distribution is for every household. And then we just draw on that on the distribution for every household in the survey. And then sort of this is I gave you a preview of the results already. Um, so the orange dotted line is that approach one, where we completely ignore 
the, the consumption data that was collected by the private firm. And approach two is where we estimate this relationship between the two consumption measures and sort of employ this method of moment estimated and then try the parameters. Qualitatively, it gives us sort of uh, uh, similar, similar results. This is by uh, Urban Rural. Those of you who are uh, rural is on the, is, I don't think I put it here, so rural is here, yeah. urban is, uh, is on the right. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, with the <coughs> India context. So there was a uh, demonetization event uh, around 2016 that sort of affected urban India more than it affected uh, rural India. Followed by a rapid monetization again, shortly remonetization, sort of uh, shortly thereafter, and we sort of see that pick up in a city. So we see we see an increase in poverty around demonetization and a rapid recovery, sort of uh, following demonetization. Um, uh, this is an important. I'll go a little bit quicker. I mentioned this yesterday already. So this is if you put it in uh, sort of a longer uh, longer long, long. oh, yeah. I should mention, by the way, uh, what the Bala AL study is. Yeah, right? exactly. it, goes to, it goes to show that that um, um, there are different ways to sort of predict data and to, uh, in, 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 in a given context, right? And this is a very good example. We're both dealing with the exact same situation, right? There are two teams sitting across the street from each other, <laughs> giving the exact same task. The exact same data and principle to work with, but we make different assumptions about what is the best data we think we could use. And uh, we took out different prediction methods of trying to fill in the gaps, and we end up arriving at very different conclusions. So they stay very close to this um, line line. The only difference being that sort of, how did I explain to you this sort of the line method that Bobak typically adopts, where it looks, it expects. The income distribution, the most recent time survey data was collected. It then looks at growth <laughs> in national accounts. It applies this past school data. Mm -hmm. uh, it might say like 80% of growth national accounts goes to growth in mean per capita consumption. And then just shift the whole distribution of time according to the growth rate of national accounts. They stay very close to that. The only difference they do is they apply the exact same accent, but at the state level. So they have in the also upper state level. Growth data. And so at the, at the state level, it applies exactly this approach. So it just shifts the income distributions uh, for every state in India using the, the, the GDP growth data that is reported in India at the state level. So it's a very different sort of approach. It assumes that inequality hasn't changed in, at the state level. Um, uh, and then we arrive at very different uh, conclusions. Can I have a follow up question to this? Yes, please. Estimation. So, how does it um, line up with the 2017 leak data? So, um, based on the estimate that's been trans using the transformative data set? So, the, so the 2017 leak data is a bit of a mystery because so some moments of the data got leaked. Oh. Uh, the day, nobody has ever seen the public, yeah. got their hands on the actual. Right, so there was a leak piece in a blog piece or a comment somewhere that uh, shared an estimate of the cumulative distribution functions for urban India and rural India, and so you could work out moments from this. But nobody ever got to work with the household level data. Now, based on the cumulative distribution functions that were leaked, um, uh, it turned out by those numbers, poverty went up between 2017 and 2011. Some speculate that's part of the reason why the government didn't release the data. Uh, and, and again, don't quote me on that. Uh, well, uh, inequality went down a lot. So, so they, they, based on that data, there was a significant drop in inequality between 2011 and 2017, and an increase in poverty. To be fair, the trends, if, that was, if, if, if sort of those leak numbers are correct, those trends don't sit well with a lot of cognitive evidence that is available. Like, uh, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense if you expect other data sources that probably would have gone up between 2011 and 2017. Um, 
it arguably hasn't come down as much as what sort of the vowel estimate suggests, but but it's it's very hard to explain in English in an environment where you have uh, sustained positive economic. Then this uh, uh, general and, and co authors looked at Hedekar's data. So there are, there's quite a lot of data, even though the official model survey data that I would take the as the quality was is not available, there are lots of other data sources that, in and of themselves, take translation and kind of give you like a, a good picture. But it so happens that if you look at them all together, they more or less point in the same direction. Right? They, they all show that it's been. Both in growth, both in growth, both in private consumption, uh, wages have gone up, uh, the market has gone up. So, if six completely different sorts of data more or less take the forgetted picture, that suggests that it's been some improvement in standard of living in India. It is hard to see poverty have gone up for a period of time. Now, what is debatable is maybe how big the reduction of poverty could be. Um, I have a question, yeah. Uh, so, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so, the, what about the price then? Sometimes uh, it is arguably that, you know, when the income rise for the poor people, right? But then if the price rise higher, you're still going to be pushed below the poverty line. Right? There's a possibility there. I mean, India has quite high inflation rate, isn't it? Maybe more in recent years, but I think there was less. I think there was, I mean, I'm... I don't know. I don't know for sure, but was that was that a big issue in 2011 and 2018? I think maybe inflation, at least globally, is. More But, uh, but I don't know the. Uh, so I, I, I'll think I'll make a mental note and, and look it up for you. Yeah, I have another question. Yeah. So, um, what is the uh, superiority of using the MOM, the method of moments, relative to the MLP? Because I you often you people use the MLP. Yeah, but in, in, we it, cannot apply it here because because we don't. You mean that uh, the relationship between the two consumption measures? Yes, correct. You use the MLP. So we cannot use your conventional maximum likelihood maybe, which would which would correspond with something like OLS, because we don't have a sample of households for which both of these variables are observed. So we have these two different. So you want to run a regression say between Y and X? Mm -hmm. It's just you have two set of samples yeah. of different sample of households, completely different households. Okay. In one sample, you observe your Y variable. In the other survey, you observe the X variable. But there's not a single household where both Y and X are observed, yes. right? So, so you can't run your conventional regression. So that's why it, the only way we could think of, of trying to work out what that relationship is, mm -hmm. is by adopting a method of moments that yeah. is. Okay, thanks. Anyway, so, so the, other, the other point I just want to highlight here is that we need to do a prediction sort of type of analysis, something along the lines that I was showing here, to work out how poverty or inequality may have evolved. This is India, but you, you can think of something similar to Malaysia or some other countries. It is very difficult, if you ask me, to collect corroborative evidence, right? Because at the end of the day, you're trying to piece together how in important levels such as poverty has evolved over this extended period of time. It, it helps strengthen your analysis if you're able to corroborate your findings with a rich set of any other sort of data sets you're able to get your hands on. It's a lot of extra work, but it really helps solidify sort of the case uh, you're trying to make. 
And, and there have been no attempts to say now that the, given that the late last few couple of NFHS runs have been so thick in terms of both of covering more than 150,000 households, you have GPS coordinates, uh, lots of things on assets uh, to try and kind of, uh, there's no consumption uh, elements in it, to try and see how does the NF, what does the NFS show in terms of thinking about, clearly has to be a non-consumption based yeah, measure of poverty, but- We have it somewhere, uh, I forgot. We, we also looked at other, we looked at the, uh, Elements, uh, mm -hmm. NHS, all of those data we, we so we we literally uh, took on board every data set we could get our hands on that is indicated one way or another how mm -hmm. sort of status of living may have evolved in India. There was a lot of work, but I think it helps take my case, and I think it also helps win over some of the initial skeptics in the country because we were able to present such a rich and comprehensive corroborative sort of analysis. It was hard to make a call at some point when you bring that such a rich body of evidence to the table. Um, anyway, I think I think. Uh, are there any other questions on this? Yes. So you mentioned that the the assumption which was made is inequality was considered to be constant or doesn't change, right? So if you see the growth, uh, uh, that's it. That, that's in the bottom of the yeah, but in your in your case, there was no extrapolation. No, in our case, we don't have to make that. Yeah. yeah. And the second point is this uh, one point nine dollar poverty measure. So this, uh, we, you mean the choice of poverty line? Yes. So in our study, we we have like uh, we we evaluated poverty for like three or four different choices of poverty line. I'm just showing the results for one choice. But in our published in our paper, you'll see results for a variety of poverty yeah. Any other? Yes, Malay. So I'm going to get a little bit closer. Yeah. So the difference in the results that uh, between our study and the other yeah. study. So yeah. So yeah. is it driven by that assumption that in <coughs> is it? Uh, it's uh, so it's a good question. So um, for those, of, so it's it's not so much. No, it's not so much. So we at some point were asked by um, by some economists to do a deeper like a probe into why, what, what, is, mm -hmm. what is responsible for the differences between our estimates and theirs. And um, I actually have slides on that, I just don't have them in the package here, but if anyone is interested in this, like why is it that sort of our study and our study arrives at some different conclusions, we did an in-depth investigation into that. And uh, in fact, we I can put it to a blog. We, we, we put it out as a blog. Um, uh, I think it was the Center for Global Development posted our blog on that particular question. And so I can, if you were interested, I can share the link for that blog piece. Mm -hmm. um, but it was not so much that. It had more to do with that they were, the Bala and study was a little bit opportunistic. Mm -hmm. but remember there's this possible rate where, so you observe growth in say, this GDP series, in this case, state GDP. You observe say 10% growth. Then you have to, Decide okay, the 10% growth in GDP, how much growth does it imply in income, capital, or consumption production survey? So ideally, you estimate the cost of it, right? So historically, you've been observing growth in initial accounts, you've been observing growth in consumption per capita. So you can sort of work out what the relationship, the elasticity is between those two variables. So what they did is they looked at national, so not state level, national accounts, national level. Uh, they looked at what is the pass through rate for that initial accounts and percentage of government. That was close to one. Then they went to a completely different series, the state GDP data, which is different from the national account data. They applied the pass through rate that they observed in that national account series. They even applied it to the state GDP data as if that sort of is the same thing, which it is not. And that's when. So they apply a pass through rate of one, which is, uh, which is, which is, Way too high. So what we ended up doing is we said, you know what? Let, let me try to stay. Let me try to sort of um, 
let me try to break this sort of the approach they're trying to implement and do it to the best of our ability. So what we did is we took the state level GDP data, which is available for an extended period of time. We also took the household survey data for the last uh, 25 years or so in India, and we simply estimated like that. Like at the state level, we, we have GDP growth data, we have growth in uh, average income per capita over like a 35 year period. And we can simply estimate that relationship. Like what is the relationship? What's the pathway between the subject of capita growth as observed in the survey first the GDP? And we got a pathway rate that was significantly lower than the pathway rate that they were applying. And when you apply the pathway rate that we estimated, that that closes like two thirds of the gap or so, or 80% of the gap between our estimates and their estimates. So I think it's, it has much more to do with sort of the, the, the possible rate that they assumed than it has to do with that assumption of it. So maybe the other third might get close to it. But the, by and large, the line share has to do, I think, with the, the possible rate. Um, Was the possible rate a linear? Yeah, so you, you, you basically assume a linear relationship between the, between the... I mean, you can make it more complicated if you want, but typically... Uh, you would you would fit a linear model between twenty five observations of data can be there's a king or there's a there is not yeah you, you could make the model more complicated if you want to but by and large people fit and in fact if you look at the data a linear model seems to seems to provide a, a good fit to the data um, okay time for the next how are we time wise do we have a uh... A 10 minute uh, pause. I mean, it's like three, two, I mean, we're gonna have like have up to half an hour break. We can do it right now. Yes, I'm flexible. So whatever the point is. I mean, it's probably a good point to take a break and then we come back a little bit earlier, like 20, 25 past an hour. Sounds good, yeah. If it may take a few minutes for them to feel set up outside. No problem. Yeah, that's not fine. So, but I mean, there's supposed to be a public break. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. So I can give you. So this is the question we're going to be touching. <laughs> <laughs> now moving forward, that's going to be the quick. Um, I vote, I mean, I've already indicated to you that for course reasons that are, that are, in, like this in Southern Africa, for example, it's, it's very typical that, uh, that population can only be estimated every five years for certain health indicates it's bigger still, like it's not a huge sea gap of 10 years, right? But it's for course reasons. So, but if, if cost reason is an important reason for gaps, you can imagine that it's very tempting to start adopting these predict data um, um, as an alternative for collecting expenses. Collecting, implementing consumption diaries, implementing health testing, etc. It's, it's very expensive, uh, which is why we observe these low frequencies. Well, if agencies observe that prediction methods can do a half decent job in filling the data gaps, maybe we can expand the use of predicted data uh, as an alternative to collecting these more expensive data. Um, and so, and so that's the objective of this project. Now, I should tell you that, uh, uh, right? It's a small thing to perhaps purposefully create missingness. Uh, by by uh, by predicting data instead of other collecting. Now this is the paper that you're interested in the nitty gritty details. It was published in Global Economic Review. It's joint work with Robert Fuji. I forgot the exact year it was published. 
but it also turned out that it's a rather technical study and may have, and my grasp of the nitty gritty technical details may have faded a little bit since I wrote this paper. So please bear that in mind as I walk you through those slides. Mm -hmm. um, but are there any questions so far? So the, I guess the premise of the study, I hope, is, uh, is clear. So um, with this slide, uh, uh, I'll just walk you, it's basically an outline slide. So the question is in predicted about the alternative. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at what is known in religion as a double sampling prediction. Okay? What a double sampling prediction does, it says, okay, so the survey is set out to visit, say, 500 primary sample units in the country, and, um, and it is going to sample, say, I'm just saying, 30, 40, 50 households in every primary sample unit. But a double sampling strategy does, it says, you know what? I'm going to collect all of these cheaper to collect covariates for all the households in the sample, right? All the 50 households in the piece you say. But I'm going to save some cost by collecting the more expensive variable of interest, say the diary consumption data, for a subset of those households. So I might only collect the consumption data for 10 out of 50 households in every primary sample unit. So you save costs by collecting the really expensive variable of interest for a subset of your of, of the households that are part of your survey, while you continue collecting all of the covariates, right? Age, education, employment, etc., that are relatively easy to collect and that are known to be strong correlates. Well, it's okay. Now, the advantage of this double sampling strategy is that because you collect the, the, the income data or something of a subsample, is that it allows you to train a model that is by construction, this sort of a fitting to the population of interest, right? Um, uh, uh, so whether this approach works or not is an empirical question that we're going to investigate here. Uh, and uh, we're going to consider a wide range of sort of underlying parameters that might shape both the data as well as the cost, the cost of collecting like survey data. And see under this how how much how much scope there is for saving costs this way under this variety of different sort of conditions. And um, the preview answer is, and I'll we'll work the way to that conclusion is that based on our empirical explanation, the benefits of predicting data is is relatively limited. Right. So you have to bear in mind. That there's a trade-off here. So you save costs by, by sort of only collecting the expensive variable interest for a subset of the households. But you introduce additional statistical uncertainty, right? So predicted data is not as precise as actual observed data. So there's a trade-off. Sure, I'm saving costs, but I'm also uh, in losing statistical position. So if the objective is I want to meet a certain statistical precision constraint. The question is, how much money can I save by meeting that statistical precision constraint? Way it turns out, it's 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 hard because of the additional sort of uncertainty that you're introducing. Achieving a certain statistical precision constraint typically means that the amount of savings you're able to uh, to achieve for this strategy is going to be relatively. You would have to you would have to. Look at uh, conditions that are rather exceptional in order to generate more meaningful gains. It's sort of our conclusion, but uh, let, let's see if, uh, if you agree with that as we move along. Um, okay, so, so as I said, there's some nitty gritty sort of uh, technical details here. I'll talk to the relatively quickly and focus mostly on the intuition. So uh, we're going to assume a very standard sort of linear regression specification. Uh, y C H is is log of household consumption of four household H in uh, area C. X is the set of covariates. <coughs> X are covariates that we've been talking about uh, for the past two days. 
And then we have a, an error term where we do it for some spatial relations. Okay, so nothing, nothing new here compared to what I told you uh, earlier. Um, we can skip this. Uh, some notation methods. Um, so the the big YCH in is going to be sort of uh, the welfare metric that we're interested in. So, for example, if the interest is in headcount poverty, this will be a double variable. That's not, it expects household level consumption loss of the government and it checks if the consumption is above or below the borderline. But there could be others, it could be average or consumption. So, it's just a, the big YCH is, is, is ultimately sort of the, the outcome indicator that is of our interest. X is a set of covariates that, is sort of, that can be collected at a relatively low cost. And so this, this function G is the expected value of the wealth of variable rate has to be conditional on the covariates that are actually available. And then the error term is the gap. So this is the YCH you would observe if you had collected the real data minus the expected value of the variable rate has to be conditional on the cheaply available covariates. The difference between those two uh, is, uh, is this epsilon, uh, so this is all error term. Now, uh, the parameter of interest is mu, it's the expected value of that wealth of variable, right? Think of it as, say, the headcount poverty rate. It's not the regression coefficient theta, right? So theta covers the relationship between the household wealth of variable and these covariates, right? What is the relationship between household, say, right? poverty status versus its demographics, education, employment, etc. That relationship is governed by theta, but theta is not really interest of this study. The study is we want to predict, say, the rate of poor in the country as cost effective and efficient as we possibly can. That's the that's the focus. So the, the most obvious estimator is simply a simple mean, right? So say we observe the poverty status for every household in the country, y bar is simply taking the average of all households in all clusters and and Think of it as a Jing or the, the poverty rate. Okay. Where J here is the number of clusters and K is the number of households within clusters. And for sake of for ease of exposition, we're just going to assume the same number of households in, in every cluster. Uh, okay, here are some properties for simple length estimator and a decomposition of its very structure. I'm on board with that. Uh, okay, so the, the double sample. Uh, prediction estimator is takes on this form, right? So we obtain an estimate of theta. Again, theta covers the relationship between those cheaply available covariates and the variable we're ultimately interested in. That allows us to compute for every household this expected value of the variable we're interested in, condition of those covariates. Once we have the expected value of the variable interest for every household, we can simply now take the average. So instead of taking the average of the observed, Indicator, we're taking the expected value of the predicted wealth indicator for every household, once, which we can do once we have an estimate of theta. Okay, so this is the, the alternative. And um, so here are some, uh, some properties of, of this uh, uncertain assumptions. Now, one thing, of course, now is that we have sampling error. Some of you have had if you work with third data, but this is additional editor, and that's this this V theta, right? So V theta is because we're working with predicted welfare for the household, those predictions are subject to model certainty because we don't know the exact theta that relates the observed welfare variable in interest and the We have to work with an estimate. So that's kind of we use statistical certainty, and that's governed by. Okay, so we save costs, but we add statistical certainty. And this is an important component uh, that sort of uh, describes that, that added source of statistical certainty. Um, so here we, we do a sort of a vanity decomposition of this, this sort of double sampling prediction estimator. So there is a term, sample variance that scales to n, uh, n, oh, I could I, I want to introduce R somewhere. Oh yeah, here, R. That's important, the, the parameter. So R, so remember K, that capital K is the, the number of households that are sampled in every cluster. The number of households for which 
all the cheap competitors for like before. The small k is the subsample of households for which the expensive consumption variable is collected, right? So, for example, if 50 households are sampled in every kind of receptor unit, for those 50 households, education, employment, age, gender, et cetera, is collected. But if we only collect 10 out of 50, the, the, uh, the consumption data, then R will be 0 0.2, 0 0.2, right? Only in that case, only 20% of households are given. So this little R, describes the share of households for which the expensive variable of interest is going to be collected. And so uh, uh, that VI captures the, the amount of uncertainty that scales with uh, the number of households that are in sample, a small, small n. VA, uh, VH is, uh, is uh, a small error. Right, so that scales with the number of observations I can use to run my regression. So that's why the R comes in here. Right, if I only collect data for twenty percent of households, then it's n times R. Right, so the n times R is now five times smaller, and that is what's going to determine. Right, the more observations I can use to run the to estimate the theta, the smaller will be the variance of the theta. <laughs> and there's another various component. It's a part of sample variance that scales with the number of clusters. Right, so there's going to be some spatial information structure in the data, and some components will can only be averaged down if we increase the number of clusters. So part of the sample variance goes down, scales with the number of households, part of it scales with the number of clusters, and then there's this model error. It scales down with the number of observations that are used to estimate the this theta hat. And you, then, you mean for which we have collected the outcome also? So what? So the R, so the, the second term that depends upon the number of, in terms of, you refer to in terms of the double sampling in some sense. Yeah, so in the double sampling, remember that, so say we collect a sample of 10,000 households in the yeah. survey. Yeah. 2,000 households, we collect the, the consumption data. Mm -hmm. So it's those 2,000 observations we use to run the consumption regression, right? So that's where low consumption is regressed on all of those covariates. The, same, the variance of theta hat, right, that drops the relationship between household consumption and those covariates, that variance, that variance for variance matrix, scales with the number of observations used to the getting. So if I go from 2,000 observations to 4,000 observations, I get more, more precise estimates of theta hat. And so, so my, my statistical position is itself will go up of my double sample, but also my cost will go up. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately, what we want to investigate is that trade off. Right? So what is the sweet spot? Sort of, uh, of course, if I spend more money, I get more precision. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so now if we want to, if we want to examine that trade off uh, between statistical precision and cost of data collection, we need to make some assumptions about how much it costs to collect data. Uh, this was actually the most challenging part of my project. It is surprisingly difficult to get any intelligent information about the cost structure. I mean, people collect survey data all the time, but nobody seems to bother to write down exactly sort of how they arrived at the receipt of their uh, of their survey. And so, uh, after a lot of uh, exploration, we managed to get our hands on a couple of teams that did sort of uh, carefully document sort of the cost structure of the survey. Um, and that allowed us to calibrate like uh, a cost function for survey data collection. And it allowed us to calibrate uh, some of the parameters in this cost function. So uh, when I was in general, we, we normalize the budget cost of collecting one more household to a unit. Um, tau governs the discount you would get by not collecting the consumption data. For that, right? So if tau is <laughs> 0 0.5, okay, then you have, you have two households, one where you collect just the cheap variance, the other household you collect the cheap variance, but also the expensive half of something variable of interest. If tau is 0.5, it means that for those households where you only collect the cheap variance, you get a 50% discount as far as the cost of data collection is concerned. That's what tau is. So the lower tau, the more the discount. The more expensive it is to collect the uh, consumption data. C is the cost of adding a cluster. 
right? So this involves making a, a journey, mm -hmm. right? You have to travel with the whole team to another village uh, full of data. So the, all the travel and logistical costs that come with adding a cluster to a survey is, is measured by the parameter C. Um, and you can see here that, uh, so, uh, uh, for uh, R, again, R is the number of households. So if, if we don't, if R is, uh, is one, we collect the, the, the data for all, for all, the consumption data for all, for all households, then this, this discount uh, disappears from the, from the consumption. The smaller is R, the more sort of financial savings we're able to achieve by invoking the discount down. Okay, any questions on this part? So now we're at the point where we have some handle on the cost function, right? So we know that we're gonna collect data for so many clusters and so many households have a cluster. We have some data on how costly it is to add another cluster to the survey, or what kind of discount we get by not collecting the expense of interest. And at the same time, we have a sense of what the, the value, st value structure of sort of uh, uh, of uh, that is associated with the variable interest rate, right? So we we for this particular study, I forgot how many countries. What we collected, we adopted survey data for I don't know, I think a handful of countries or so that allowed us to sort of get a sense of how does the statistical position of estimates of poverty for that population vary with the, the, the number of primary sample units in the survey, the number of households in the survey, and sort of the spatial population structure that's present in the data. And so we have a handle on how statistical position varies with the sample design. We also have an idea of what, how the financial costs vary uh, with the sample design. So now we're at a, a situation where we uh, where we can do an optimization, right? So we can say you know what? Minimize the financial costs. It's about do you calculate the point margin cost for the region one more household? You know. So what? These are this is linear. These are cost margin cost, right? Yes, exactly. We also we also have like a lot of some familiarity in the paper. Uh, so it's open, but it is in the paper. It was never if I'm sampling everyone in this room, but not some one one person, then the margin cost is getting one person. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not in this linear function. Mm -hmm. Um any fixed cost could do that. Yeah. It's it's so uh, I truly call that when we first put in the paper to journal, we operated with this linear form for what it was was tractable, made our life a little bit easier. But I remember one of the reviewers uh, Insisted that we also adopt a nonlinear cost function to, to capture, and so I think all through the paper, if you if you will, if you look at the paper, you'll find also results for a nonlinear cost function, and qualitatively it doesn't change. And 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 on, on these like kind of coming up with the what the solution to this optimal problem, are they going to have really suffer from being very site specific? No, like. External validity is going to be extremely. You can only think about it for every particular context, right? Because well, we can vary those things, right? So, so, so regions will vary in certain parameters. They will vary in spatial correlation structure, mm -hmm. right? They will vary in general the vary structure. So that's on the data side. They will, but also the cost will vary. Sort of the the town may vary. The fee that governs mm -hmm. the cost of collect adding another cluster versus another household will vary. Yeah. So there are a lot of parameters to vary. Yeah. That will help us distinguish between different contexts, and so we do that. So we say, you know what? We have data both on the cost side and the, the empirical side, like what the, and that allows us to calibrate these parameters to different contexts and see for those different contexts. What makes like does does the trade? -off. You may well find that the trade-off is favorable in this context, but not in that context. Uh, so that's exactly what we, what what we aim to explore here. Okay, so the, the optimization problem looks as follows, right? So we can set, and this is a dual problem and the solutions are identical. Doesn't matter which way you approach it, right? So on the one hand, you can even say, you know what? Uh, I want to achieve a certain level of statistical precision. 
let's call that feed bar for say our estimate of poverty in the country. And I want to do that in the in the most cost effective way possible, right? So what what is the optimal double sampling strategy here? Um, and and let's see is whether R is false in interval zero to one, right? It doesn't rule out the possibility that R might be one, right? The, the most cost effective given sort of the the, the, problem, the most cost effective way may well be simply collect all your data, right? Uh, because the 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 loss of precision that you introduce by working with data data might not might not sort of uh, compensate for the financial contribution. So we don't know. But that's we'll find out if that's the case. Alternatively, we can we can impose a budget constraint and say maximize the decimal precision. Okay. So if we uh, if there's an interior solution to this optimization problem. Then the optimal R, the optimal share of uh, households for which you want to collect the expense by willingness takes takes that form. And uh, um, um, that's out the, the dog. So the WH is uh, captures. Um, the importance of model error. So if this is a situation question where model error is a very important component of statistical uncertainty, then uh, the only right so, and that remember that's the added necessity, right? By 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 not working with observed data and working with predictive data, it's the model uncertainty that's one of the key components you're adding to the to the loss of precision. If that's a really important component of overall precision, the only way to bring that down is by collecting more. Data, right? So that R needs to be bigger. And that's one thing that's born out here, right? So if if oh my god, if that uh, the WH is high, if model error is an important component of the distribution, and that, that may vary from context to context. In one context, that uh, that may be a, a more dominant feature of the statistical circuit than it is in other contexts. But of course, if that's high, uh, the optimal share of houses for which you need to collect the data that ultimately become part of your regression model should be higher. Um, anything else I see here? So um, based on that analysis, we can work out what is the condition that is required in order to satisfy that interior solution. And so um, R ends up in the interval, in other words, the precision, if this condition is met. Um, and so, uh, one thing you can uh, see if this is more likely to be satisfied, if that tau is very small, right? So, and remember what tau mentioned, the smaller tau, the bigger the discount you obtain by not collecting the expensive variable interest. Okay, so lower down, bigger discount, obviously. Uh, what makes it harder to obtain that interior solution if the WH is big again? That's what I just talked about. If, if model error is a really dominant feature of the statistical uncertainty, it becomes harder to cross that threshold. You're more likely to end up in a situation where the loss of precision that is introduced by introducing model error, you won't be able to, that won't be able to compensate for cross it. Um, whether that's ultimately when it's met or not, it's a bit of a question. It's gonna, it is going to vary from context to context. Any questions so far? See, si, uh, if I remember right, so in your model, uh, is there a reason why uh, you assume the eta C to be a random effect? Because usually, if you go to a particular cluster, uh, it could be like, for example, in India, you go to a place where there's a lot of poverty and the COVID that a specific cluster may be correlated with the variables which are correct. So, so you are implicitly assuming that your eta C is uncorrelated with your covariates. So you are using a random matrix model, right? Yeah. So is there a reason for that? Well, the idea is to, to capture unobserved 
sort of uh, geographic effects, right? So, so inevitably there are going to be some variables that yeah, would like you can you can use the fixed effect, right? Because it allows your your industry to be uncorrelated with your covariates. But in many of the developing countries, your eta C uh, is likely to be correlated with your covariates. So unless until you probably do a houseman test and see if that is the case, that is not the case. Yeah, I just think about that. That's a good point. I mean, can I get back to you on that question? I just, I just want to give I just want to give it some further thought before uh, before I provide you with an answer. But it's a good question. Um, any other questions at this point? The tau and the r is something that we said. So no, so well, so so the tau is given, right? By the nature of it's part of the cost function, if you will. R is something you as the the agency that's going to collect the data have control over. So it's up to you how you want to set R. But ideally you want to set R in an optimal manner, right? So remember we have this optimization problem where you want to achieve a certain level of statistical precision, and now it's up to you. To set, you want to pick R and the number of clusters and the number of households in each cluster in such a way that meets your statistical position constraint, but in the in the most cost efficient manner. And so R, along with the other separate design parameters, follows from that optimization exercise. But will it be a unique solution? Yes, it's a unique solution. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, okay, so now to evaluate uh, the gains from um, from uh, ultimate sampling, uh, we introduced this performance measure uh, row, which is a ratio of costs, and I think it, it, in our assumption, loss equals the ratio of statistical precision, and it takes on this form here. And uh, what is important to note is that, and maybe we should have Inverted, it, but lower values of this measure means greater gains for the, the, the double double sample uh, village estimator. So if this if this means one, it means that there's that means that the precision or the cost you achieve with the double sample estimator coincides with if you would simply want to collect the data directly, right? So lower values means there are there is scope for uh, cost savings. While preserving the statistical position constraint, or there is scope for um, precision gains while maintaining a budget, right? right? So lower values grow means greater um, value in adopting this prediction estimator. Um, and so one thing that's that you can observe here is that again uh, tau, right? So if tau is lower, rho is expected to be lower. Uh, in fact, I think yeah. On the next slide, here we expect sort of uh, in one direction this rho is is going to move if we vary some of the underlying parameters. So uh, tau, the derivative of rho with respect to tau is positive. That you would expect, right? If there's less of a discount in collecting the not having to collect expensive interest, there's less of a gain. Again, higher row means less of a gain for adopting the prediction estimator. Uh, the derivative of row with respect to C is positive, and that tells you that if it becomes if it's more costly, if there's more general cost you have to incur, there's uh, less scope for um, because that's, that's something double sampling, the reason for that is that's something a double sampling strategy is not able to reduce the cost, the travel cost that you have to uh, incur. And uh, by the same token, the derivative with respect to WC is positive for the exact same reason. And uh, not surprisingly, the derivative with respect to WH. Remember, WH governs the, uh, the, the, the magnitude of model error. That is called to be the of the decision. Um, if that is a really dominant feature of the decision, 
you have to collect more data in order to get more precise estimates to bring that model level down. But that defeats the whole purpose of sort of implementing the double selling strategy. What is the WC again? I think I. Which one? The WC. Is WC is it is the is the demand statistical uncertainty that scales with the number of plots. Oh, trust me. So the intuition here is similar as which actually see huh? <laughs> it wasn't me. What? It wasn't me. <laughs> it was C D. Okay. It was C. But <laughs> the intuition is the same with C. So if uh, if a team if it's either very expensive to collect data for initial cluster, or if uh, or if there is a need to collect more data in order to bring the variance. That scales the cluster down, if that's an important part of the statistical decision, that's not something that the double sampling can help you with. So the, the scope for gains in that type of environment will be more limited. That's the key feature. Skip. Um, uh, yeah, so to find, uh, to bring this to data, uh, uh, to get a sense of what are the other, how difficult is it to find contexts where there might be some meaningful scope for gains, we, we have to calibrate both the parameters that uh, are part of the, the underlying data generating process. Right? So then this is WC and uh, WH, right? It tells you the importance of the model error, it tells you uh, uh, to what extent statistical so certain scales of the number of clusters. That is something that may vary from country to country. I could measure collect data from Malaysia, do the same in Malawi, do the same in the US, and do the same in, in a couple of other countries. And I, I expect the statistical properties of, say, estimates of poverty in this number of different countries. You'll see that uh, you'll see that uh, the degree to which the statistical precision will vary with the number of clusters and the number of households is going to vary from country to country, precisely because different countries have different spatial planning structures, uh, different relationships between the consumption and uh, its underlying covariances. And for that, for those reasons, WC and WH are going to vary from context to context. So what we did is we collected household survey data for a variety of different countries to calibrate the range of values we empirically observe for, for both WC and WH, okay? So we, we have a range of values for that. C and tau are parameters of the cost function that dictate sort of uh, how much it costs to collect the survey with an X number of clusters and an X number of clusters per clusters. Uh, we appeal to whole separate source of, sort of information for that. So as I told you earlier, we managed to get uh, uh, data from two projects, two or three projects um, that were kind enough to, uh, in a very detailed manner, so uh, look at how the cost of the survey varies with, with the subject design. And that data allowed us to sort of calibrate a range of C and a range of R. Any questions on that? Ah, so here, uh, oh, okay, the other question. So, so WC, WH were calibrated using data for Cambodia, Malawi, Niger, and Tanzania. And uh, the cost functions, the, the two studies that we used to calibrate the parameter of cost function come from a paper by the AL. I think the information is not necessarily available in the paper, but they had sort of auxiliary data that. Uh, or are published, but they were willing to share with us in the paper by Ahmed A.R. Uh, so this sort of uh, uh, calibrating these to these sorts of data allows us to identify a low range, a mid range, and an upper range for the parameters in play, both for C, for tau, for WC, and WH. And so now that we have empirically plausible ranges for all of the parameters that are involved in this sort of uh, optimization scheme, we can try to figure out well for all of those combination of parameters. May we expect to see gains uh, 
by end of things, by predicting data rather than collecting it. I'll skip this one. This is the table that uh, evaluates that expected row measure, which sort of uh, I think the gains. Again, lower values of row means bigger savings, right? So if row is 0 0.9, it means a 10% saving of using predicted data rather than collected data. Um, under all of these different combinations, remember that we identified the low range, and mid range, and upper range for all of the parameters involved by calibrating those parameters to, to observe data. And in this table, we look at all the possible combinations. And as you can see, is that um, the gains are very marginal at best. And it should be noted that um, these gains are under rather optimistic assumptions because we haven't, uh, what we have been assuming so far, furthermore, is that that model that we use to predict data is correctly assumed, right? We haven't even contemplated the possibility that that model we're using to predict data might be somewhat misflexible, right? So if you really make the assumption that that model that we identified is a capture through model generating process, even if under that somewhat known assumption, right, the gains from uh, using predicted data rather than collecting it are very marginal uh, at best. Any questions on that? Um, um, now, uh, Having said that, uh, even though that's a pretty possible range, by consulting like uh, I think four or five, uh, sorry, four or five countries and sort of two sources of uh, with information on the cost function. So even though maybe I'm just saying in like 80 or 90 percent of contexts, the scopes for gains might be very muted, and more muted still if we're opening up to the possibility that errors might be bigger because of what all these things. That doesn't rule out the possibility there might still be cases where the, the gains might be right. There might be examples where that tau is particularly low, right? Where the variable returns is so expensive that the discount is greater still. Or where the, the, the cost of travel is very limited because the, 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 the study and of interest is a small, like, prosperous um, area, say Singapore, where everything is within reach and you don't have to incur a lot of travel costs to play data. So you may well be contexts that are very unique, uniquely suited to, uh, to this kind of strategy. But uh, based on our exploration, our sense is that those kind of contexts are going to be the exception rather than the, the rule. So for, for, for most realistic settings, you're better off collecting the data rather than predicting it. But again, that also doesn't mean that uh, predicting data is not a valuable resource, I think it is, is uh, for one, because it's still a very, is in many cases, maybe the only way due to filling data gaps because because sort of data is missing other reasons, right? That's why we have the India study, that's why other we have a Myanmar study, so we have a Venezuela study, right? There are probably a lot of contexts where data is missing for a variety of other reasons, and using prediction methods may be the only way for you to fill in data gaps. What we're more skeptical of is exploiting sort of that framework to now deliberately start to predict data rather than to collect it. If, if, if you have a choice to collect data, if the environment allows you to collect data, you're better off collecting data. Any, any questions on that? I think it surprised me that if the travel cost is low, that we're better off predicting um, in a previous slide. There are notable circumstances where double setting is good. And one of okay. it is. Uh, okay, so which, which bullet are you now? Uh, so the last point where if it's, okay. there's low travel cost, that is actually better for us to double sample than to actually. Yeah, sample. because because uh, the, the travel cost, this double, double sample strategy, remember that it, you visit an X number of several units, an X number of villages in the country, and you have to visit those villages anyway, mm -hmm. but then you're only going to collect the expensive mm -hmm. 
value of interest for a subset of households within that AC. Right? So if the full sample means 50 households in every village, and you only got to collect the consumption data or your health indicators, then of those 50 households, that will not help you bring down travel costs. So if travel cost is a really important component of the overall cost, the scope of financial gain is going to be, are, are going to be more muted. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 Okay. I assume yeah. going yeah. to see. <laughs> ah, so, <it's>, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so ignore this last message. <laughs> but the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're moving on to the last um, the last of my slides. Uh, and I think might even be able to finish slightly early. Um, okay, so so the 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 previous slide concluded with the fact that is what I I I, um, I missed out the word. The word that the previous said is not just double sampling religious strategy; is the nested double sampling religious strategy. And where we concluded that that strategy uh, offers. On the most reali realistic sort of conditions, very limited scope for, for, for making meaningful gains. Um, uh, there is also a cousin of that strategy, which is known as the non nested double sampling religion. Can anyone guess how this non nested model differs from the nested one? Does anyone dare to make a guess? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> is in a non nested case, you don't collect the expenses variable in the new survey that you're about to collect. You're not going to collect the expenses variable for any of the households. You're going to rely on an already existing data source to train your model and then go out, collect new data, but only the cheaper you available data. And then you're going to predict your data using so so the scope the scope for gains and I'm much more positive right because I don't have to collect the expensive data for anyone I only have to go out into the field to collect the cheap covariance of interest so by construction the scope for making more meaningful gains is much bigger now the flip side of that is of course the scope for making errors is bigger now as well right because inevitably you're going to train your model on maybe an older survey or worse still, a survey from a neighboring country. Right? So you have to you have to train your model with something that already exists. By construction, that survey is not from the same point in time, otherwise you don't need to collect new data, right? So it's either either you have to train a model on a data set that's outdated or it's for a different population. Okay? In so doing, you're training your model on something that opens you up to making more of this case you have, right? So one beauty of the previous, the nested double service that I showed before, even though the scope for gains may be more muted, but at least you're protected against sort of the obvious model of this case because by construction, you're collecting data, albeit for a subset of a household, but you're collecting data for the current population, for the country of interest at the same point in time, right? So. That set of observations, I'll do with a subset of the sample, speaks to the sort of the, the, the population of interest. Uh, so in this framework, and it is this is probably the framework that's more commonly adopted, in part because there's a greater scope of the issue game, but but also greater scope for them. Okay. So so Tomoki and I, same goal as the as a big study, uh, uh, are currently this is work in progress on a follow-up study. Uh, so uh, that previous paper was well was also a little bit polarizing. It was welcomed by people who are very much thinking of collecting data and skeptical of data makers, but it, it, it received a very good warm welcome to people who are big advocates of uh, sort of using prediction methods. 
And so they felt like, well, you you only found this, this modest gains precisely because because you were insisting on collecting data for the population of interest. And uh, okay, fair enough. So that's why this this sort of follow up study was born, where we're we're going to basically revisit a similar type of exercise. We are open to the option of bigger financial gains, but we're also serious about trying to capture okay. These gains come at cost of trade and error, and those trade and error should be factored in when we redo this this sort of a, a fair sort of uh, optimization study. Um, okay, so I think I said this part. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, the, sort of the these are slides I made last night, so they're a little bit less detailed and less technical than the slide from the previous session. Um, uh, the measure above recalls that performance measure is the exact same measure I just literally borrowed it from the previous study, right? So this is from the nested one. Uh, the measure that is listed below is the measure you would obtain in this non-nested framework. Okay, so one um, uh, so one thing that disappears from the top row is, is one minus tau tab w h, right? It's not quite, you're not collecting your current survey, any observations that might help you sort of change the, but that cost me significant. It's a stock cost that's already there. What is introduced is this coefficient uh, over here. Um, and that uh, parameter a measures um, the, uh, the current statistical error that is relevant to the current generation as a share of the total error, and the total error is that same statistical error, but it also includes that model error that you might be opening yourself up with. So uh, if that if that A is very large, it's good because it means that most of the error is statistical error and the model misclassification error that sort of this non that it might be exposing itself to. Is modest, right? If A is very small, it means that moral misplication error becomes a, a critical component of the total error structure. So A is a very critical parameter. So, so intuitively, the fact in that you would require that the thetas don't change over time. Exactly, exactly. So, exactly. So, either across time or across country, so you take your data to Thailand, you apply it to Malaysia, yeah. you want to return to education, return to demographics. Are, are, are comparable, even across time or across the years. Yeah. And if there are more investigations, if you're, so if you're in reverse education five years ago, you apply today, but there's, there's been a notable shift, yeah. right? Then A is going to be lower. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So it's exactly it's to what extent that more investigation error, if that becomes an important driver of the overall position in the non sort of uh, method, then A is low. If it's all sampling error, that can be amplified out by just collecting more covariates. And sort of this, this more misplication error is not, it is a marginal, makes a marginal contribution to the, to the estimator, then A will be large. Okay? And as you can see, right? So if A is large, this row will be low, which means, again, okay. low rows will make the scope of A's. Yes. But this is used and you can see there was in both countries. So in, yeah, in this comparison, we, we, we assume the same. But use some information that say if you think that Thailand has a different intergenerational mobility, so maybe uh, than Malaysia, so you not include it. You see, I mean, well, if there's, you can improve on overall data or prediction by selecting on variables. Is that possible? Or will it be a Sorry, I don't know if you use some other external information yeah. about these two countries. Yeah. And select your variable based on that to get a prediction for the age of it. But in, in principle, if you want to train a model on, say, one country and apply it with liberty, you, you'll have to use variables that are shared, right? Otherwise, it won't work. If you, you train a model on one data set, you your liberty to completely maximize the set of variables that you're able to input to your model. So, so whatever you can realistically or practically include in your Modeling exercises, include it. Yeah, but I was talking about excluding some variables so that you have a better fit dollar. So let's say there's some variables which are noisier than. Ah, uh, uh, 
Yeah, so so we're going to operate with the assumption that somehow this has been done in optimal manner. So that, that whatever trade offs exist in that exercise, you manage to find an optimal function. So that's the. So that's why I say that all of this does is in one extent optimistic, right? Mm -hmm. We want to assume that this has sort of all optimally worked out and whatever, whatever, if you are negative on the line, we have captured that. So realistically, we might have to do less. Some of those assumptions, which then go to slightly reduce the gains. From, uh, so, so we, we're giving it, we're giving it uh, the benefit of the doubt, if you will, these, these rich methods. Uh, okay, so A is the, so we've already introduced W A, W C, and C. Uh, A is the really critical parameter. It tells you, tells you sort of this block verification error, how big of a Okay, so one thing we can do is we can look at isoperms, right? So what are the conditions under which they're nested and not nested? So we already know how well non nested works. You know, there's not much of a game there. The question is, how much scope is there for non nested? So let's start by just looking at isoperms. What are the conditions under which those two approaches do the same results? And so this is the relationship that is sort of worked out. So if you replace the beta equal with the equal sign, then that's sort of the curve along which those two and B0 and B1 sort of take on this form over here. And if you were to visualize it, um, this is the 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 this would be, uh, so here is the square root of A, and this other parameter square root. The square root of S also captures um, the importance of uh, in the statistical position scales with uh, with, with plus. So you want you want that to be long. Okay, A is a really critical one, right? So for a given feature of the the sampling sampling error structure, you want A to be large. Large A means it's all statistical authority, model misclassification error is modest. Okay? So for a given structure of the sampling variance, given sampling variance structure, if if the actual A is above sort of those isoperms, it means that non-nested estimator will, will will give you better results than uh, the nested estimator that I presented to you uh, prior. Um, and here we, we compare the nested, it's the red line, versus the, the orange one, the green one, and the other green one are different flavors of the non nested one for different choices of the, the critical parameter A. And uh, as you would expect, so orange one is, uh, is a Within those three, it's comparatively low value of A, so we're, we're, we're open to what, somewhat large contribution of model misclassification error. You can see that if tau is really small, so you get a huge discount of collecting data, sort of the non nested may beat, uh, may beat the, the nested one, but, uh, but very quickly it will stop beating the nested estimator. Um, it's a empirical question, however, how big that A is going to be? Like, how 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 vulnerable is the non nested rich estimator to more misclassification error? Right? You say the more misclassification error creeps in if the, the returns to education or the returns to uh, the the or having a job. And so, so if those regression coefficients are subject to change over time, that's exactly where some of the small error creeps in. Is there a bit of a question as to how common that is? And just to give you a quick sense, the other thing I did last night, if I if I could briefly exit this and I just show you some graphs, does that work? So just to give you like a, a rough flavor, what I it is um, okay. So for like a handful of countries, so we um, we for this project, 
for 16 countries, we, um, see, that was gonna be my next slide actually. So here, for 16 countries, we, uh, we harmonized. So we identified surveys where we have a good number of repeated cross sections, right? We harmonize them so that we have a similar set of properties for those countries. And these are countries for Central Asia, East Asia, Southern Africa, Latin America, Europe, etc. And we use these data to get a sense of what is the degree of model stability. And if we violate the model stability, what kind of bias can we reasonably expect by ignoring, by just negatively assuming model stability when in fact the model is stable all the time? Um, and so, I'm just, I just look at a few of them and I just quickly walk you through what you see for some of that. So we estimate a similar type of model. Low consumption is regressed on a similar selection of right-hand side variables to those 16 countries. And I will just briefly, um, here, this is for urban rural. This is for example, so it's not beautifully, oh, but it's not have a mobile phone. This is what it says? Yeah, mobile phone. This is in the case of uh, was it Brazil, the first one. <laughs> yeah, Brazil is the first one. Okay. Now, not completely unexpectedly, perhaps. So, what is the, what is the regression coefficient on, say, owning a cell phone tell you? It is indicative of the value of the price of owning an asset, right? So, if you owned a cell phone back in the day when cell phones were very expensive, it was a strong signal of your level of income, right? Fast forward X number of years. You owning a cell phone isn't as strong of a predictor of your level of income as it was back in the day when cell phones were very expensive. And so it's not surprisingly that if you would look at the regression coefficients on cell phone over time, it's going down, right? Cells becoming cheaper, more widely accessible. So if you would pick an old model, an old data set, train your model, and then naively fast forward a couple of years and try to predict it, you're gonna, you're gonna get it wrong. Uh, have a computer. It's a bit mixed within rural urban, but it's in urban Brazil, you see a similar pattern uh, for owning a computer than what we saw for owning a cell phone. Uh, a fridge is a bit more stable. So uh, certainly, it, so this has to say that it's not like model stability may hold up for some coefficients, but not for others. As far as asset ownership is concerned, the variables where you really expect to see lack of stability are precisely those variables where the relative, where the, the, price, the relative price of owning an asset changes meaningfully over time. Fridge doesn't seem to fall into that category. Cell phones, computers are. Unfortunately, these are also important correlates of consumption. Um, uh, does the household have access to internet? That's uh, reasonably stable. Uh, washing machine, like fridge, reasonably stable. Uh, fixed landline. Um, far from stable. Television, reasonably stable. Uh, pensioners, share of, is, is somehow going up in both. So there's a premium on being older in Brazil. Maybe because they're getting like uh, uh, pension income. Uh, uh, being a single person household, very stable, rural, and that effect's coming down a bit in uh, uh, education. This is uh, the, the regression coefficient in years of schooling. So it's like approximately sort of the returns to education, uh, especially in rural Brazil has come down uh, a lot. So this is just Brazil, just to give you a flavor. Now, what does this mean for the other figure I produced for those countries <coughs> is, um, is, is, so what we do here is, those vertical red lines, so we train a model, the full set of covariates. The red line is the year where we try to predict. Right? So that's the natural shear that we made this year. That's the year we had to like achieve cheap covariates. And then the, the years prior to the red line, in speed, so that figures, that's very nice, right? So here the red line is 2008, and here is 2006. So we consider an exercise where the objective is to predict poverty in 2006, or to predict poverty in 2009, or to predict poverty in 2010, etc. And then we vary the year where we train the model. So for example, in this case, right, we try to predict poverty in 2008, 
But here we train the model on data from 2005. Here we train the model on data from 2002, etc. Right? And uh, not surprisingly, if you train the model close to the point in time where you also want to predict, let's go, medical bias. So what we're calling is bias. Remember that I'm calling it bias that you change in your SS coffee, and that bias purely stemming, completely stemming from the fact that you have a mistrust model. Right? So you ignore that those selective instabilities that we observed in the regular coffee. You ignore the fact that the only a cell phone or computer sort of went down considerably. Um, but as the model becomes more outdated, these bias can become very meaningful. Um, well, that's for Brazil. Uh, just to show you that uh, Brazil is no means an exception. We've done this for uh, what other country? Wanna, India? Bicycle. Sort of owning a bicycle in rural India was uh, a sign of wealth back in the day, but that's no longer true uh, today. In fact, in urban India, it's even become a negative. Um, owning a motorcycle, however, has become a more of a premium. So mm -hmm. motorcycle is now a stronger indicator of wealth than owning a bicycle is. Um, so motor car, this is a, 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 a car, not a motorcycle. This is the same for motorcycle. So kind of quickly run through. Owning a television, like what we saw in Brazil, is relatively stable. A house, being a single person household, far from stable. Uh, electricity, the main source, is quite stable over the last couple of years, but if you go back far enough in time, it was being connected to the electrical grid was like a huge indicator of, uh, a huge predictor of your income. That, that's what, presumably back in the time when connected to the electrical grid was like a privilege, more so than it is, than it is now. Uh, house ownership, right? As housing becomes increasingly more, as house, house ownership becomes increasingly more prevalent, uh, that also has become a weaker predictor of a household's uh, standard of living, and so on and so forth. So, Brazil, India, I can show you the results for some of these other countries as well, but models tend not to be stable, even over short periods of time. And I'm not even discussing cases where you use a model from a neighboring country to predict. Um, but you might think, do you want to see more countries, or is the message clear? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when we talk about predictability, both matter, right? The point estimate, but also By the way, this is the same graph. In it. Sorry, what? The variance around it, right? That. Yeah, sorry. In this case, I just bought the bias, but you could look at the root mean square error, for example, as well. Yeah. F f fair enough. Let me first open the slide back up and then I'll. So the lower the bias, then it will be better, right? Lower buy is better, exactly. Yeah. And so one thing that consistently holds up, uh, the more of a gap there is between the, the survey that you use to train your model and the population where you want to use the model to sort of estimate the variable you're interested in, the more, the more of a scope for bias, stemming from the lack of model stability. Uh, is that captured by the bias and then uh, some of the... Uh... The steer, the line is longer than others. So in some in some countries, you mean some of the lines, the the midpoint is the average, right? So it's the lines, the colorful. Ah, uh, the line, this 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 vertical red lines. You mean? No, the, it, it it's just I just added those red lines to indicate mm -hmm. those are the years where we're predicting poverty into, mm -hmm. and then the 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 preceding years are the years where we train the model. So what you've noticed is that for. If there's a bigger gap between that red line and sort of uh, the point in time where we train the model, it means there is a bigger, a, a bigger time, gauge, a time gap along which model stability might manifest itself and consequently a, a bigger scope for, for bias stemming from model misspecification. Um, okay, so... Okay, so here what we did in those figures will just provide like an open only. So we have those 60 countries. And for those 60 countries, we have multiple years. So it allows us to look at many different combinations. Like just for Brazil, we can look at predicting poverty in 2008, estimated 2007, 2006, 2005, 2004, etc. But also predicting 2010, predicting So any one different country can have multiple combinations. Plus we have 60 countries. 
So we pulled all of that data together. So look at what is the magnitude of bias in my picture. And this dish summarizes the equation in density plots. And as you can see, sort of the bigger the gap, sort of the more that more density we have uh, towards the right, the more the more scope of bias there is. This is urban rural. This seems to suggest that uh, there is more scope for bias creeping in and rural areas than urban areas. So um, that gives you some rough indication that this whole model, like more stability, may be a bigger issue in rural countries, parts of the country than it's urban. And this plots the bias as a function of gap. So again, we pulled all of the data together. And we just check how does this bias vary? Again, the bias can only come from model instability, right? As we vary the gaps in years. Why does it go down after eight years or something? Yeah, that's it could go either way. That's uh, I don't think that's I don't think it should be too much into that. It just so happens in the permutation of data system. But I think I mean you can't expect you know there's no reason to expect the bias to go. Off into uh, infinity, right? So not infinity, but I think if I have like a if I wanted to predict something from there from 50 years ago, it would be quite substantial. I would have, I would expect an increase, maybe an increase in the rate, but we converge. Huh? We converge. Like, yeah. Well, a, you, you should also keep in mind is that the number of observations we have here is not constant, right? So, so the number of observations where we observe a ten-year gap is a much smaller set of observations than when we observe, say, a three-year gap or a five-year gap. In our case, and yet we just throw in size of sense, for example, where you have bigger. I, I, my, my guess is, is I wouldn't read too much into this simply because this is a much more select set of observations. Like the bulk of the data. Observations will be will be here, and so and so clearly you see that uh, that bias stemming from more of is something we should be worried about. When anyone adopting this non-nested sort of big estimate operates on the assumption that this is a non issue to begin with, right? You 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 have to, you you're forced to operate the assumption that the model was specified, and I think the empirical evidence suggests that it is not. Uh, and this is just so. And again, let me just stress this whole exercise. We haven't we haven't yet considered the case where we train a model of country one and then apply it to country B. Actually, I should make it better. <laughs> <laughs> and you you may you may think that's silly. Then you think, well, why would you do that? Like that's like it's it's Mushoka an international term. People say that it's what we say. Um, I think it's Jewish actually. Well, it's but it's adopted. I think it's Jewish. Yeah, exactly. It is Jewish. Exactly. Yeah. But in, in the Netherlands, it's widely adopted. Uh, uh, it it is it is surprisingly widely adopted. So if you look at the health literature, for example, the the. The global, the, the global weather of disease databases that are out there, whether they detect tuberculosis, mortality rates, age, or a variety of, of <coughs> close to 90% of estimates. If you open up, if you go to the World Health Organization or you go to other sort of outlets that sort of collect global databases on health behavior, mm -hmm. etc., close to 90% of all the numbers you see in the databases are not there, but all that I've opened in the data. In many countries, and that, that, these are like cities, yeah? so you go to the World Health Organization, you'll find for every country in the world yeah. a time series of, say, annual mortality rate for the last 30 years. In 90% of those cases, but it, like a really rough amount, there's not a single data point for that country. Observe mm -hmm. the entire time series is predicted. Wow. Right? So that means that, say, the time frame, I'm just making stuff up now, but say the time frame for some people. There might be like one country in Africa, South Africa, where they choose the data points, they train the model, and the entire series of Zambia is predicted based on data that was derived from a model that was trained to maybe a village in South Africa. So you think it's silly, but already today, no. global databases, 90% of the data is predicted. 
and not typically by an outdated model for example which is one thing if the estimate, if there are certain points along the third year history of Zambia where the gaps are filled by using an outdated model for Zambia. No, we're using a model from 1970 South Africa to fill in the entire cities of Zambia. <laughs> so so for example, I just quoted a paper here. In Southern Africa, adult mortality estimates for say the year 2000 are based on observations like real data wow. from only four out of 46 countries that are when you say this other four. So for the other 42 countries, the entire series is predicted. Models are trained from maybe one, two, or three, four countries. For all the other countries, it's predicted. And so there's no, been, and has there been any attempts to, like, again, look at how mm, uh, robust are these predictions in some sense? Because if you would think about this, I wasn't aware of this, but if you then think about books like Deaton and all, you know, then they are susceptible to a lot of criticism because, like, let's say one of the big gains in this part of the world is, are these health gains, right? And if these health gains are now, we have no gauge on what is the extent of errors in the we prediction. Yeah. Then we are in a very poor state of the world, no? We are. And, and, and what is more, we have now reached the point where this has become so common practice. It's often a little bit clear anymore what data points are real and what data were predicted. So people now see this global database. And it's hard to tell which, which data points are real and which ones. So it's now to be fair, at this point in time, just for standing here or sitting here in your case, this is Far more widespread in the health and disease sort of literature that is poverty. Yeah. But I'm starting to see movements in the poverty literature as well. I see the increasing appetite for resorting to prediction methods to track, monitor poverty. So I think we're not quite there yet, but I feel like we're slowly moving in that direction. So that's why I'm pulling. Once ages have developed a taste for cheaper data, once the incentives are there, yeah. it, it will take some effort, to, I think. Uh, and uh, I mean, these data that you showed, uh, they have, some cases they were moving in predictable ways. Is it correct for that? Or they're just using that. So that's good. That's good. That's very good. You mean, you mean if you look at, say, at uh, mobile. the regression coefficient of mobile phone or something, yeah. like we can correlate that with price, uh, like you said, relative prices, but like, say, trade yeah. or or. No, so that's actually, so I mentioned this is an ongoing project. So it's a good point. So this is actually part of our ongoing project. So you know what? In some cases, this moves to a very pretty point. We can make that part of the model. Right? So we can just fit, say, a linear. You cannot do more than a linear trend because you have to bear in mind that trend you're going to fit. The only observation you have is the number of time points, right? So if you have five, six surveys, in effect, you have set five, six data points to fit a linear trend, which is not completely unironic to fit the trend on five or six observations. Uh, but it may, in some cases, if it, it does stay for a linear trend, may, may help you uh, make some chip away that sort of device and extend from input consuming exposure to that approach. But you're also opening yourself up to make even bigger mistakes, right? Because I can show you plenty of charts where it looks like linear and then goes up, right? If you have to see the go up part and all you see is this, you fit your nice linear trends, and then when you predict out of sample, and in effect it goes up, while you predict the continuation of the downtrend, you may make even bigger mistakes than you would have made had you simply assumed it was stable. So, yes, there is scope for chipping away device, but by the same time, there's scope for making even bigger errors. So, it's, uh, but work is, it's something we might explore as well. And, and what's this, uh, do you know the name of this paper that you're quoting there? The... Yeah. Yeah. Is that one thing? Yeah. 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 And sort of these references over here are part of the paper. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but also, there's one more slide, but if I want to make it not before I forget it. Okay, so I just have a, I think one book, two, two.
two concluding slides. So these two concluding slides just a bit of flavor of uh, some other ongoing work that sort of builds on this debugger, right? So, so I think I've made clear to you now that some prediction methods for all its weaknesses, for all its reservations, are becoming increasingly more widely adopted. And it begs the question of what is the value of big data, right? Without framework, we're trying to sort of get to that question, like what is the value of the data. But uh, we have this uh, this project ongoing with uh, G2 Dust, Tyler McCormick, and myself. Um, and it's in a relatively early stages, so any, any suggestions or feedback you may have uh, is very much welcome. But let me just give you like a, a sense of what the project is about. Okay, so there is, uh, okay, before I start, uh, let me just first tell you that uh, it's an important technology, especially when it comes to this knowledge framework, right, which is the framework that has been adopted to uh, populate these global health databases, right? Clearly, they adopt the known nested structure, right? Because they're killing data for 42 countries where not a single data would collect. So they've been using them. So these are studies where they open themselves up to a more mixed classification error. So it's just important to stress there are two sources of error, right? One is pure statistical model error, right? That's, that's the type of error that you have with the nest error, right? So there's less scope for moral misplication error there because the regression coefficients are trained to the population interest. But there's still statistical uncertainty, right? Your beta hat, your beta is necessary. In a non nested case, in addition to having the statistical model error, you're now also vulnerable to moral misclassification error, right? That is not really statistical in nature, right? You can't you can't put a statistical sort of so we think of that as ambiguity. I know if any of you are familiar with the concept of ambiguity. So ambiguity, there's a whole literature on ambiguity, but it says, you know what, it's a bit like a, um, uh, when you're asked to evaluate the odds of a certain event, but you don't quite know what the true probabilities are. So there's two. First of all, there is the odds. Something might be 30, 70 odds. That's purely statistical, right? So if you flip a coin, a coin or if you go to the roulette table and you bet on either red or white, you know it's 50 50 chance. That's purely statistical. The outcomes are have a known statistical, but there might also be games where you don't even know what the true probabilities are. Right? So you have, you still have the statistical certainty, but in addition to that, you have to deal with the fact that the probabilities themselves are unknown fundamentally. And that's what the literature refers to as ambiguity. The, the two different concepts of uncertainty. Some, some have also referred to the ninth case uncertainty. Now, uh, and so I think that is helpful in our case to sort of, we, we're going to view that model misclassification error that we can't really put this of a hand on. We're going to view that as ambiguity. And then there's the statistical uncertainty that comes on top of that. Now, there is uh, an exist a rather large, uh, and actually stock prices are a good example of that. If you look at the, the, the stock financial returns data, right, the, you don't really know what the underlying distribution is. But the underlying distribution itself is subject to unknownness and liquidity. And then if it were to know what the two this is the one, then we still have the statistical uncertainty, right? So the, the this as a result, there's a very large, a rather large and growing literature on optimal asset allocation, right? So portfolio managers, uh, the challenge they face in the spot of money, we can invest our money into uh, an X number of different assets. We have some estimates of what the the, the distribution of financial returns are, but we also cross this some ambiguity. In sort of the return distribution for all financial assets. Now, what is having some knowledge on the degree of ambiguity and the degree of uncertainty in the return distribution for the different assets? What is the optimal way for me to invest my money, allocate my budget in those assets? Like the optimal asset allocation. So, okay, so there is, a, there is now a large literature that simply works out what the optimal way to allocate your money across different assets in a world where the financial returns are subject both to statistical uncertainty and ambiguity. So it's very close to the framework. So we're gonna what we're thinking of is just take that framework as a point of departure and we're going to interpret those uh, financial returns, not the financial returns, but like um, uh, socioeconomic returns. So it's not so much the portfolio manager 
that has to decide how much money to invest in Philips versus Nike versus Apple versus uh, Nvidia. No, it's now there's a decision maker that has to decide how much money to invest in any A versus any B versus any C, right? Uh, and the returns are so economic returns, right? The idea of the policy, the public investment in an area is to sort of create some sort of returns for the population. So it's a different interpretation, but the framework is exactly the same, right? So you can literally just borrow the framework and interpret it as a, the portfolio manager is a public decision maker, and the public decision maker is, has to work out what is the optimal way for me to allocate the public resources that I have into different areas of different domains. And these domains can be geographic in nature, they can be thematic in nature, it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so now this is the last slide. And again, we welcome any feedback since we're still at a competitive early stage of this recent project. So your feedback uh, may allow us to shape the trajectory of this research project. So the first thing is that uh, given the cost for data collection, right? Uh, by how much would collected data lower statistical uncertainty and activity? Right? That's something we can basically work out. So we can try to work out that if we want to invest X amount of financial resources into collecting data, we should be able to work out how much that buys us in terms of statistical precision. Then we can also say, okay, now if we have uh, uh, now better, uh, better data on the returns distribution, right, uh, the social returns, because we've collected data, we now have better idea. We can work out what the expected social returns are. Uh, and we, we are able to attach a cost, right? So we're in a situation where we can go out to collect data. We know how much it costs us to collect data. We know how much uh, uh, what it gives us in terms of additional statistical precision, which in turn leads us to better expected sort of returns. Then by plotting one against the other, the expected social sort of returns against the cost of data collection, it provides one way of trying to work on the value of data. And then we can do that under different contexts and different sort of, uh, uh, sort of emission making contexts. So one idea we want to do is we want to explore whether depending on the sort of the decision-making context, under what kind of circumstances is there great value in collecting data? And by the same time, there may also be context where maybe the value of collecting data might be more reduced, where the decision-makers perfectly well helps by having a cooler sort of uh, estimate of, of, of the, the returns. So that's one. Two, uh, we could endogenize the sequence. And that's something where we're going to deviate from sort of the existing here, right? So in the optimal asset allocation framework, the, the returns on assets are completely independent on how much money Shafat invests in Apple, right? Uh, and so there's no there's no sort of endogeneity there. It's different if you if you adopt the framework to study uh, public investments, right? If there is an area or a domain in need, you're not helping that area. Right? Not investing in preventive solutions may, may introduce big costs further down the road. Uh, you uh, not investing in a child that is from the age right? may make it much more costly to sort of help a child further down the road. So there is, um, so there will be some variety. Sort of investing in an area early on may change the sort of economic return further down the road. Right? So there's an endogeneity there. And so we can enrich that framework. We can take an existing framework as a point of departure, but then add sort of that endogeneity that may not be relevant in a financial asset allocation situation, but it may be very relevant in sort of this public investment framework that we're thinking of. And then finally, we want to think a little bit about using that framework to see if we can identify optimal data collection strategies, right? So would it be optimal to collect data for areas with the greatest needs or those where the present statistical uncertainty and ambiguity is the greatest? Uh, that's it in a nutshell, and we welcome any suggestions. Mm -hmm. So okay. can you use this to answer how many units, how many units you would need to sample in a region? 
depending on how uniform that region is. So that's okay. yeah. So that, that I think that would fall in the other than some go there. Okay. And this is side point. What application of this would be? I mean, the customs statistical yeah, agency are always concerned about how much, let's say, the gain should be sampled when it's crossing the border, crossing the border, because there's a cost of that should, and then there's a risk factor. Okay. I thought I think that would be a very good. Okay. okay. So that's, so okay. so actually, one thing we've been looking for is very concrete decision making context yeah. where sort of. Where one could try to tease out the value of having data, and so, and so that's that's something where it would be uh, it would help us a lot if you if so. This sounds like a very specific, concrete sort of uh, like that decision making problem. So please, please, uh, I'm actually going to make a note. Shafat is going to share with me. So how should I how should I frame this? Uh, homework for Shafat. <laughs> <laughs> But I think the idea is similar. They're trying to select how much sample they want uh, to inspect mm -hmm. the customs uh, containers crossing the border, given the risk level and the cost, the client cost of doing that. But that kind of similar to like income tax returns, or how many? Yeah, so I think you're right. I think I think that yeah. that example will will so be nice to have uh, to have some some uh, more texture on that. Yes. Uh, I have uh, two comments to make. One is basically, from what I understand, like uh, as you correctly pointed out, ambiguity is like an idea and uncertainty. It is exactly the same. So yeah. in that case, the probabilities are not known. Exactly. So if you have four quadrants, say first quadrant, I know that I know. Second quadrant, I know that I don't know. The third quadrant, I don't know that I know. And the fourth quadrant, I don't even know that I know. Yeah. yeah. So the ambiguity is the third and fourth quadrant. So I don't think uh, so because it's going to not be ergodic, right? So what is the path, the distribution of the path in the current? You can't have the, an ergodic distribution, right? So 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 in that case, estimating estimating or measuring is, that particular point, I think is completely ruled out, right? So well, that kind of uncertainty is probably. Cannot uh, or with or uh, as far as I know, it's very hard to model. So, so it's so I mean, the how we see it, that we can be uh, try to picture again uh, sort of these regression coefficients. So let's say we, we looked at uh, owning a cell phone, right? And and so, uh, if we're interested in the regression coefficient for owning a cell phone today. And if I have run a sample, a lot of sample households today, I can run that regression and, and sort of estimate the coefficient. I won't, I won't know the certainty, but at least I'm running the regression on a sample of equations that are uh, that apply to the to sort of the intensity. So I'm just dealing with statistical certainty. Now I'm going to estimate a model. Uh, I'm going to again estimate model today, but I'm interested in applying it on five years now. I don't know what the coefficient is going to be five years from now, right? So that's where the ambiguity comes in. So I have some fiscal certainty, but I also have ambiguity. I have no idea, I have no real, and, I, and also I'm not able to attach a meaningful sort of probability distribution to the change in the regression coefficient between now and five years from now. So that's how, sort of that's how we see the role of ambiguity in, uh, in our favor. You see what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You know, you know, what is your problem more than one statistical uncertainty part of it? No, we're gonna we're gonna make ambiguity is part of the framework. You'll just have to make some assumptions about you know, which is the start start of the ambiguity, so which is basically should be in the dark. Uh, and and basically the second point which I want to make uh, or make is based on yeah. before the team. Can I ask the point? Uh, you can of course that's how we <laughs> In India, you can see uh, the latest energy survey, the malnutrition has been reached compared to last. So that defines. So which survey? The NHFS. Five. NHFS, the, the one that just came out, like uh, yeah, yeah, the latest, half a year ago or so? Yeah, so that has shown that the malnutrition in India has increased. So that uh, is, uh, that goes against the. Uh, 
No, in some states it's increased, some states it's gone down. Yeah, so the ag aggregate... But the aggregate remains stable, more or less. Stable, but here the poverty line, is, uh, poverty estimates are coming down. And but malnutrition is a very difficult animal. That, so that is why, uh, even if the poverty line, I, I don't believe, but even if that is uh, that's correct, yeah. I would say that income uh, probably is not the only measure. I think one should probably look at the multi-dimensional poverty, right? I think... Uh, these estimates are basically based on dollar or some income, right? I think uh, I think one has to look at like calorific poverty or multi-dimensional poverty, and that will probably. Uh, yeah, so I don't I don't happen. disagree with that. So so I actually I mean pay drop. So I I I very much uh, am a fan of looking at multiple dimensions of poverty. What I'm not a fan of is trying to mesh that together into like a single indicator of multi-dimensional poverty. Okay. I think it's much more informative that if you just keep track of say four, five, six dimensional poverty, but but inspect them side by side okay. and get a more complete picture of uh, yeah so I, I completely agree with you we should not be narrowing in on this one restricted sort of indicated welfare. So consumption poverty should be inspected alongside child malnutrition, alongside adult mortality, alongside uh, a variety of other uh, indicators. Any other more questions? Or, su or suggestions? Not questions, suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know if it's related, but like, could this also be used, for example, to to improve targeting of transfers and, and... yeah. So, so absolutely. So, in fact, we were originally thinking of uh, taking that as a part of the part. Remember that I showed you that uh, Albert's AL put us a seven paper yesterday, early on to motivate uh, having access to a poverty map, mm -hmm. right? So, then the application was a little bit different. Now, the government has like uh, X amount of money available, and it wants to maximize poverty reduction. And so it's first going to target the, the domain where the gradient to transfer in a dollar is uh, is highest as far as poverty reduction is concerned. Is it, so that is a slightly different uh, decision making problem. Um, at the moment, that 2007 study operates under the assumption that the income distributions are known with certainty. It's like as if I, I know what the income distributions have in history. And that's how that simulation study is implemented. Now, of course, in practice, we don't know that. At the very minimum, there is a physical certainty, and top of it, there may be sort of ambiguity in the shape of what almost per skin here. So we thought maybe another decision making contact we wanted to take on is just revisit that dimension in the context and now account for the fact that there is uncertainty. How is that going to change the optimal allocation of resources in order to alleviate poverty reduction? It's, a, it's just a, it's a, it's a much harder problem mathematically. And uh, we would have to solve ourselves from scratch. So we thought it's still on our menu, except we thought let's start with this because here the optimal allocation problem is already worked out. And it's not an easy problem. Right? It's like this work is published in Acrimatica and the Journal of Life. So these are hard problems. So even the optimal S allocation problem under uncertainty and is a hard problem, but it's a happy that it's been solved by a couple of people. So taking that as a point of departure seems like. Seems like might as well just stand on the shoulders of giants, as they say, right? So, uh, so we thought let's start there, and then focus our attention on sort of the question that really we're really interested in, take advantage of the work that is already done by others, and then maybe afterwards we'll go back to the, the poverty targeting, right? Where the application is the company is just implemented, do something reform, and they want to soften the the blow for poor households. Here it has not been worked out. So if we want to here we would have to sort of work out the optimal allocation rule ourselves from scratch. Yes. So uh, one of the projects that I had done before uh, was looking at the multiplier impact using the social account metrics. So I'm not sure how this will relate in your picture here. Social input output and social accounting metrics data. Okay, I'm so we can not familiar with that. Uh, the input output data and the social account metrics data where when you can calculate the multiplier impact across the, uh, in Malaysia context for that data, we have across like 67 sectors. Yeah. So we find that okay, when you inject, let's say 1 million, so which of the sectors here that is going to generate like highest multiplier impact for the economy? Yeah. And then which of the households that is going to have highest multiplier impact as well as a okay. result of the investment 
in this sector and which of the uh, labor market in the rural area or the urban area that is going to be stimulated more. So okay. I think that was uh, one way that I had done from my experience where uh, we find the sectors and the households allocations. And you are, so I'm not, I'm not as clearly not as familiar with this as you are. Oh. Um, but it sounds interesting. Could I ask you to uh, share some material yeah, with me that, sure. that allows me to sort of uh, get a quick understanding oh, of, so of if, this type of work? Yeah, so if you have run the, let's say, uh, those who are running the computable general equilibrium, the CGA, the inputted data for that computable general equilibrium is not the time series data. It's the uh, input output or social uh, social accounting metrics. But maybe one day we can discuss more about this. Yeah, but it, it would be helpful if you could first share some of the rules so that I get to know this, mm. because it would be hard for me to say something yeah, intelligent sure. about it without we having first had a chance to yes, yes. have a look at it. Any more questions? Yeah, so okay, then thank you very much. On that audience, please remember, like yesterday, it takes a scan from the QR code or people online. Maybe I should have asked, are there any questions from our online audience? If so, you can just chime in. And if not, please use the link that you have been sent to evaluate this event and give us some feedback because it's very important. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for coming. Thank you.